everyone. It's criminal profiler Pat Brown, and it's Cindy James Day. Um, and the reason it's Cindy James Day is because this audible thing came out called Death by Unknown Event. And it's super, super, super popular. So even though this case is like over, hmm, over 30 years old, everybody's talking about it all of a sudden. And I, I didn't have Audible, but my daughter got it behind my back and she she had just watched, uh, listened to this whole thing. So I'm like, oh, well, okay, I can go ahead and do that as well. So I'm going to talk about that in a second. But first, I just want to say hello to everybody. Um, and I want to very much thank, I want to very much thank, because I do have a, a super chat going here because they're going to demonetize this one for sure. Um, <laughs> so thank you very much, Benny. I appreciate it. You're just awesome. And also Nicole, Nicole sent over one too. So thank you very much. You're, you're amazing when you help me out here. So um, I want to thank everybody. Everybody's here. So many people here. Okay. I've already said hello to everybody. So they are there. Oh, maybe I didn't say hello to uh, Florence yet uh, or to Steve. Uh, so they just came in and Doreen came in. Oh my goodness. <sighs> and everybody else I've already said hello to before the show started. So now, just want to say something, two things. One is I'm on camera number three. It worked really well the other day. I I, I was going to work on it because if I got, I'm really washed out and I don't seem to have any color, although I do seem to have no wrinkles and like a Botox. So that's cool. But um, I, I downloaded the software and it won't open up. <laughs> so every time I try to get a new camera and do something, something goes wrong. I don't know why the software won't open. So this is just automatic. So this is what I look like today. Um, so anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, that's one thing I wanted to point out. Secondly, I want to point out because uh, well, some some hater came along and he just said, you know, you're it's way too long. You should just say what you have to say and stop it all. And I try to remind people that this is not that kind of channel. I'm not trying to tell you what I think uh, and have you just, okay, that's what Pat Brown thinks, whatever. I'm trying to teach here. So this show especially, what I'm going to do is a little bit different. Um, I actually spent a lot of time on this uh, this podcast, and I typed tons of notes. I basically typed the whole podcast out for myself and made notes. And so what I'm going to do today is a little different. I want to take you along, and I want you to point out the red flags you see, things that I'm going to say what I saw are red flags. I want you to come up with what you think are red flags. So I'm going to ask you a lot of times, what about this? What do you think about this? What's wrong with this? picture. So that's, hello, Annie. Hello, Maria. A couple more people. Um, uh, so there's something wrong with a lot of these pictures. So I want to go through this Audible um, show. Uh, and they, oh, for, oh, that's very nice. Thank you, Anne, so much. Oh, I appreciate that. I'm trying to do the best work I can, and I hope I can improve it over time. Thank you very much. Um, so what I'm going to do is yeah, um, you may have seen this audible, this death by unknown event. You might have already, you can't see it. You have to listen to it. <laughs> it's a podcast. So if you've already listened to it, you'll know a lot of what I'm talking about as I go through it. But my point of going through it is two things. One, I want you to feel the process and see what all the points are and see what you come up with. <clears throat> How about my voice? <clears throat> And also, I want to point out some weird things about the podcast and show you how you can be manipulated when they're telling a story. And there's things that are out of order or information that you're not given at all or information that you're given later on so that you think one thing and then later on they're like, oh, then how about this? And you're like, oh, well, that makes a difference. That, that's, that's real different. So I want to point out a lot of these issues with the telling of these stories and true crime and also what are all the red flags we can pick up. So that's what we're going to do. And yes, if you're really in a rush, probably not the uh, show you want to listen to. <laughs> you can go someplace else and get a 10 minute show. This is, this is why I do these. You're a couple hours long. I go through everything and I take everybody along for the ride because I'm trying to teach profiling and teach crime scene analysis. So that's why I'm here. So anyway, uh, before I get started, let me do the other needful thing, um, which is, which is what? Which is, hold on a second, folks. <laughs> there we go. Um, uh, 
as always, I say, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do that. It's free and it helps immensely trying to keep this channel alive. Also like, share with people, and uh, you can hit the bell so you get notified. If you want to come to Hangouts during the week, you can join Patreon and, and then join level three and come to my Hangouts. Um, or you can just, a lower level, just support the channel on a monthly basis. And that's wonderful. Or buy my book. That's $2.99 at Amazon. And money goes to the channel with that. Um, it's a wonderful fiction story, a, a psychological mystery. You'll enjoy it. And then down below, there's other links to my books. And that's that. All right, let's go now. And this is a super chat. So yeah, <laughs> so that helps too. Okay, now let's get to the story because it is a really, really, really bizarre story. I'm going to give you the, a real short version first, just so some of you who do not know this at all uh, can have an idea of what this actually is about. Okay, so here it is. Let me, let me tell you the basic thing. A nurse named Cindy James, who was 44 years old, was found having been drugged, strangled with her, let me repeat that. She was found drugged, strangled with her hands and feet behind, tied behind her back. Yet investigators thought it was an elaborate suicide. Here's just the basics on her. This happened on June 8th, 1989 in a suburb of, of Vancouver, British Columbia. But the story of what happened to Cindy started over the seven years previous. Because in those seven years, Cindy reported over 100 incidents of harassment, harassment, stalking, and assault, actually. So it wasn't minor. This was absolutely some really outrageous stuff. So now let's find out about her um, before I start this, this rest of the show. Uh, I just want to point out who she was. Um, this is her family, and I have a picture of her um, there's a picture of her mom and dad. Where are they? Here they are. Uh, this is this is dad. Uh, that's dad on, on the left, mom in the middle, and Melanie is her sister. And the reason I want to bring them up is they truly, truly believe to this day that uh, Cindy did not make up any of the stories, uh, all these hundred, these many, many incidents and the assaults. They believe she was being stalked and she, somebody did murder her. So I just want to bring up that the family is totally thinking that. Okay, so that's the family. Now, this is what she looked like. She became, she when she, uh, her family moved to Europe, she stayed in, she stayed uh, behind in Canada and went to school as, and became a nurse. And you can see right there, very pretty, pretty, pretty girl. I mean, she was actually very, very beautiful in my opinion. She's quite stunning. So she had the looks. And over here, what it's showing is she loved to work with emotionally disturbed children. And so that's what she did. And she worked for many years for this one organization. And she was supposedly excellent at her job, just excellent. So she was well-liked um, and, uh, you know, was a good, good, good employee for, for that matter. So that's, that's the one I want to start out with. Now, I want to point out something else. There is almost nothing really about her early life. There really isn't. It's very, very limited. And if one believes she might have a psychological disorder, in my opinion, Munchausen's, um, and I will explain Munchausen's in a second, if she has a psychological disorder, she would have had it when she was young. She would have had it growing up in her teen years and during her marriage. So what happened eventually was she married and let's see, she was 19 and she met, um, she met this guy. His name was Roy Makepeace. Where's Roy? Here's Roy. Okay, so she met Roy Makepeace. She's she's 19. He is 18 years older. So, and he was also, by the way, married and had two children. Mm. And so she, he was cheating on his wife and she was helping him cheat on his wife. And so, but there was an 18-year difference. There he is. And you can see here, there they are, happily married. Happily married for a long period of time. Um, in 1982 um, is when they were they they got separated, uh, and supposedly the story is that and her husband was cheating on her, and she found out um, that was the claim anyway. And then they separated. Um, it's very unclear who filed for divorce. It says in this article she did, but then another article says he did. So it's hard to know. 
And then at this point in time, this is when the incidents began. And so I find it interesting that when I went through this whole podcast and I just couldn't find any information on what was she like, really what was she like as a teen and as a, as a, as a young woman, did she really do her job and no one ever saw any inkling of weirdness, you know, before this, this start, the starting of the stalking incidents? Did they, did nothing at home ever pop up that she was manipulative or very narcissistic? You normally, you just don't change overnight like that. So that's one argument people have against this, her making up these stories, because usually there is a big history and there, and most people, well, from the outside, because we don't have much information on her, are assuming she was super healthy, super happy, everything was great until she and her husband separated and then somebody started stalking her. Maybe her husband. Mm. So my, my concern is that, yeah, we don't have the information on what she was like through most of her life until these incidents started. But if she did have Munchausen's, she would be highly narcissistic. She might have, uh, many people thought she would, uh, the psychiatrist thought she had borderline personality disorder. And if that's all true, it didn't pop up just when she left her husband or they they split. That doesn't make sense. It has to be there prior, at least some aspects of it. And I can't find anything because there's not much out there. And let me tell you why there's not much out there. Cause it's, this is kind of funny. Um, I went to buy a book on this case. I really, really wanted, really, really wanted this book. Um, here's my book. Oh, don't do this to me. If this thing disappeared on me again, I'm going to be very annoyed. Well, that is interesting. You know, I've had this happen a number of times where something I put up there suddenly vanishes and I can't understand how this is happening. Hold on one second. I'm having a, now I'm having a technical problem. Um, I don't know why. I can't I can't see some of my my stuff. One second, please be patient. That is really odd. Okay, I'm going to try something cuz I did this once before. So I'm going to I'm going to try this um, to see if I can get back the one that's missing. Hmm. Oh, maybe I put it over here. <laughs> Hold on a second, folks. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's where I put it. Okay. <clears throat> There's two places you can do. I can have a green screen behind me or I can just put up the overlays. It went to the overlay. Okay, here it is. Now, this guy in the middle, you'll see his, his name is Neil Hall. He was a journalist who was around at the time. And I really, really, really want to read his book. It's called The Deaths of Cindy James. Um, but if you look over to the right, you will see it is now uh, selling for $489 on Amazon. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, no, I'm not paying 400 over $400 for a book. So I could not get the book. And it was very frustrating because I did read a few reviews of the book and they had some interesting information which didn't show up in the, the podcast. So that's why we're missing information. And you have to be a little bit, you know, things with a grain of salt because not everything is there and it's very frustrating. So, so anyway, here she is. She's now married and now she's separated. So this is where all the stuff starts. And so now I'm going to go to the um, the podcast on this so that you can join me in all of this. Um, what does she, she say? Um, oh, wait a minute. I, gotta, I, gotta, I just got to read what this is. This is thundering fun. Um, I'm sh I, I, for sure, I like how Pat's style is something different. There's hardly variety on here. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, and, and, Be and Benny says, I'm also a big fan of the, this format but mostly because Pat is really teaching me points that no other show does. So I'm learning and enjoying it. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> um, no, uh, as far as the book goes, no, there's not a PDF. I look, believe you me. So yeah, no. And that Colleen, my book was also, I think it was my Cleopatra book one time also showed up for $500. I think when they don't have the book, the algorithm throws up some really weird thing. So it actually, nobody's actually going to pay that obviously. So <laughs> but it's pretty funny. <laughs> and I'm like, no. So there's no written material. And that's frustrating to me because you're, I'm basically depending on the podcast and a few other, you know, uh, video things to tell me, you know, what actually happened. And it's just, it's just kind of 
Yeah. So now I want to go to the podcast because this is what we're going to follow. And we're going to see some of these things that just make you wonder. So I want to point out what they're, the, the woman who did the podcast is called Pamela Adlon. She is the one, one that is speaking. She has a lovely speaking voice. So pleasing, so much slower than mine. And I am trying to slow my voice down for all the people that say I make them anxious because I talk too fast. <laughs> what? How did you get that, Martin? I did not. Wow. Martin says there's a copy. Wow. For 80 pounds. Woo. Because uh, when I went to eBay, um, I only found one for, I think it was still $300. <laughs> so I didn't buy it. But anyway, um, okay, so Pamela Adlon is the woman who is the host of the show, and here's what she has to say. We looked at facts. Well, I'm not, th the problem is when they say that, you make an assumption right away that you're getting the facts and that the facts are actually accurate, <laughs> not somebody's idea of facts. Um, we looked at every publicly available police report and court reports. Do you notice the word at every publicly available? That means a whole bunch of stuff was not available. So how much they even got, we don't know. Talk to investigators and the PI who she hired. Keep that PI in mind. We're going to have fun with the PI. If she did stage this, did she also stage the seven year of brutal attacks? Seven years of brutal, brutal attacks. So the question is, there are seven years of harassment and stalking and really bizarre stuff, which I'm going to go through. And, and she was attacked a number of times viciously and ended up in a hospital. And now we have the final attack during which she dies, which either is suicide, accident, or murder. So what she's saying, if, if, she staged all, if she staged the last one, did she stage all those seven years? The other question is, if she stayed, staged the seven years, did she stage the last one? So that's kind of interesting. I'll, I'll talk about that in the very end of the show. All right. We hit a lot of dead ends. Many of the people hold tight to their convictions. Sister thinks she was murdered. Cops did not. By the way, this is paraphrased because I'm typing. So <laughs> uh, uh, the, the host of the show, Pamela, did not speak like this. <laughs> that's typing. Um, we found one theory we found particularly compelling and this, they hold out this in the beginning of the show, this compelling theory. And it's a targeted murder by a group of psychiatrists. And it's presented at the end of the show. And if you see my eyes roll like this, like 10 times, I, and it annoys me because she's holding this out. She's like, I wonder what it's going to be. And then it's this. And you're like, what the? Hmm. So, but anyway, she's going to tell us at the end of the show, the one she found compelling. So anyway, this, this is her final statement at the beginning. This is a story of a woman who lived in fear. Now, right there, when somebody says, this is a story of a woman who lived in fear, that's already telling you that she did not commit the crimes. Isn't that what she's saying? Because she wouldn't live in fear if she was committing the crimes because she had no reason to be fearful. I don't like things when people point out these things without, you know, is this just, again, is this trying to draw us in? Anyway, she lived in fear for nearly half, nearly a decade and of the institutions and individuals that failed her. So she's basically saying the police and the psychiatrists all failed her. They didn't do enough for her, even if she was guilty of do, committing these crimes herself, nobody did enough for her. And I think that is absolutely just not true. And I will show you later why that's true. All right, so let's see. Uh, just to let you know how this goes on. Um, one of the comments I put in this section is the PI says she's totally honest. He, this PI just adores her. His name is Ozzy. And he just, he's like, he's like in her corner and he thinks she's the most honest woman ever, never lies. And there's some funny stuff later about that. So keep that in mind. Since 1982, she reported over 100 incidents of stalking and harassment, assault and attempted rape. She moved houses a number of times attempting to escape, but a stalker always found her or the stalker always found her. 
Police followed leads and came up empty handed and almost zero evidence. So there was zero evidence and Cindy became a suspect for them. All right, let me point that out right here. I'm going to start this show by saying, yes, there was zero evidence that the police ever found in any one of those 100 reports to the police. They investigated. They found nothing that connected these attacks to another person, to a stranger, or even to someone she knew. Zero. Now, it is pretty damn odd, in my opinion, that the police could keep investigating and investigating and investigating and come up with nothing linking to another person. Not even something where you go, okay, there's no way she could have done this. Now, you might think it's hard for her to do this, these incidents that she, I'm going to explain to you, especially her, her, the, her death. You might think, oh, that seems outrageous, but it's not impossible. And it should be impossible. So we have some cases where, for example, if somebody is shot from 20 feet, <laughs> I'm going to say probably they were murdered because your arms just aren't that long. You know, uh, can't be done. There are times when, you know, there's just no question somebody else was involved. Um, that you, that for example, you have DNA from four different people there in a rape scene. You have, uh, you have three different knives and uh, three different guys are identified running from the house person was murdered in. You have evidence, you have DNA, you've got fingerprints, you've got footprints, you got something. 100 incidents and zero evidence. So one of the things I want to point out right here and to have you look for these red flags as we go through is the issue of does she have Munchausen syndrome? Now, interestingly enough, during this entire uh, podcast, there are a lot of psychological opinions, borderline personality disorder, uh, basically uh, multiple personality disorder now known as DID, which is disassociate, disassociative identity disorder. It's been renamed. Um, and uh, all kinds, psychosis, schizophrenia, but nobody mentions Munchausen's. And let me explain what Munchausen is. Munchausen's is. And Colleen, you asked, what's the difference between Munchausen's and Munchausen by proxy? All right. Munchausen is essentially a behavior. It's, it's, it's not a psychological condition, in my opinion. It's a behavior that is born of narcissism and psychopathy. Munchausen's is when you harm yourself or you claim to be harmed so that people will pay attention to you. A lot of the people have Munchausen's go to doctors a lot, report to the police a lot. I have, I have those ladies calling me, and that's usually females, interesting enough. I have women calling me, I don't know how many times with a stalking thing. They're like, M M Ms. Brown, can you help me? Because I'm being stalked. Uh, this, uh, this, I've been stalked for the last three years. Um, I have somebody following me in a car. They're making phone calls. Uh, they're sending me, they tell me all these things. And I ask them one question. Do you have any proof? And then there's this dead silence. And then they stumble around. But well, 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 you I'm like, no, do you have any proof? And the answer is almost always zero. Because it is not true. They are fabricating these stories and they want somebody to pay attention. They want the police to pay attention. They want a profiler to pay attention. They want uh, people they know to pay attention. Uh, ex exes to pay attention, boyfriends, girl boyfriends, girlfriends to pay attention. They want somebody to pay attention to them. So they claim they have these things happening to them or they even do things to themselves. And some people will say, I can't believe that somebody would hurt themselves. Well, what about self, what about self harm? People do a lot of self harm. What about people who slash their, the whole arm down? You know, they always got those cuts on their arm. That's self harm. They're cutting themselves up. People do some really nasty things to themselves. So, so if you want attention and you can harm yourself in some way, you could you can hit yourself with a board so you get a black eye. You can cut yourself. You can stab yourself and say somebody stabbed me. Um, or sometimes um, they don't actually. Uh, oh, it might not be an external. It could be internal. 
they might go to a doctor and say, you know, I'm having severe pain in my stomach. Um, my periods have disappeared completely. Um, I can't breathe, whatever they come up with. So they get lots of tests. They see lots of doctors. And I, I used to interpret uh, sign language at a hospital. And I had one woman who she came in all the time when she was pregnant and would claim she was having she was um, already having um, labor pains when she was six months. And it was a lie. And she was trying to get the baby C-section out of her because that gave her attention. Uh, scary people. Oh, and I want to. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, Carrie, I, that is a great point. Um, is there a link between healthcare workers and individuals with or suspected of Munchausen syndrome and Munchausen syndrome by proxy? Oddly, yes. Um, guess what? What can somebody tell me? What was um, what profession did Cindy pick? <laughs> what profession did she pick? Somebody come up with that? Interesting enough, she picked what? There we go. Thank you very much. Carrie says nursing. Benny says nurse. Martin says nurse. But, yep, nurse, 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 nurse. You betcha. Nurse. And yes, there is a link. And now try not to confuse that because a teeny weeny minority of people who are nurses have Munchausen syndrome means that nurses have Munchausen syndrome. No, it's the same thing. What is the number one? I always say the number, what are the top, I'll tell you, top three choices of serial killers for employment. Can anybody tell me that? Top three choices for serial killers, male serial killers for employment. There's three of them. What would they be? the ones they want to be. And sometimes they very, sometimes they can't attain them, but sometimes they are very prevalent in those particular industries. Does anybody know? If you've come to my, if you've come to my shows before, you should know, I, there's one of them. Uh, Martin, uh, yes, tradesmen, mostly things like um, handyman, because you don't actually have to be hired by somebody. So handyman, and of course, I've got handyman in my family. So as I point out, <laughs> most of your handymen are great. Unfortunately, it's a good job for, certain serial killers to pick pizza delivery no, pizza delivery and he says pizza delivery no. but here yes this is correct martin also comes up with security guard and molly says wait a minute, who said who the other person oh molly says maintenance man yes that would be the handy handy guy handyman guy security guard and i forgot the third the third is law enforcement very good Ms. leah okay so that is correct a lot of male serial killers want to be police officers. They love the power, the badge, the gun. But then they go in and they, the psychic Sam, like, you know, like, we're not hiring you. Once in a while, they get through and then you get like serial killer police officers like Gerard Schaefer in Florida. So you, you don't want them to get through. Now, what usually happens is they fail. So they become security guards. Most of them are not armed security, but some of them are, but most are not. They work in malls office buildings, wherever. And again, I have family that has been in security. I have security guards in my family, dudes and, and ladies. I'm not against you being security guards. I'm not saying you're serial killers, but it is a good choice for certain as a profession. So those three are very much, much of three professions for Munchausen's nursing. I can't tell you how many people who've been involved in Munchausen's are also nurses. It's, it's very fascinating. And Colleen asked about Munchausen by proxy. Munchausen by proxy is instead of hurting yourself, you use your kids. So you, you say your kids have problems or you make your kids have problems. You might poison your child. You might throw your child down a staircase and say, my goodness, he's so clumsy. You might take that child to the doctor and say, he, no, he, he's, he has a problem with this. And then the poor child goes through no, test after test and after test is put on medicines and there's nothing wrong with a kid. But the mother convinces the doctor that the child is exhibiting all these symptoms. So those, so that's Munchausen syndrome by proxy. It's like, I don't want to hurt myself, <laughs> but this kid I don't really care about. So <laughs> I'm going to use that kid because we're talking about narcissism and psychopathy, that a true ability to love is not there. So now we go back to, let's go back to, What is the gender breakdown? Oh, that's an interesting one, by the way. Uh, 
truck driver. Um, yeah, you know, there's actually not, I would say there's not a ton of cases with truck drivers, but there are some. And the advantage of that is that you're simply by yourself and, you know, you're not pissing off your boss all the time. No, but one of the problems a lot of serial killers have is they're just not very good employees because they're obnoxious. So they get fired. <laughs> so yes, there are some truckers. That is true. Um, so let's go back to Cindy. She became a nurse. And she was also, there's some theories that she hadn't had a good childhood, uh, that her, her father was overly strict and a disciplinarian. And they, they had some stories about them having to eat in the basement. And I don't know. I don't. And there, then there's some later thoughts that she was sexually abused by. Somebody claimed a brother. We don't know if any of this is true. However, sometimes, you know, lousy family situations do kind of engender personality disorders because you're growing up with something that's not working real well. Um, she had brothers and sisters. They weren't envisioned. They weren't making up stalking attacks. So why Cindy? Don't know. She was the oldest of the children, which is interesting. Um, don't know. But we, it's hard to go back and say, this is why. All I can say is, you know, uh, I believe, I believe, I'm going to say this up front, that she suffers from, not suffers from, she exhibits Munchausen. It, when I say suffer from, that would mean she had no control over it, that she, it was disorder, she didn't know what was going on. Uh, some of the psychiatrists said she had that split personality kind of thing going. So that one part of her didn't know, the other part of her was doing all these things. But she was, I believe she was very calculating, which is very true for Munchausen's. They're very calculating. They plan how they're going to do these things to get the attention. They get better and better at it, and they often escalate. Just like a serial killer escalates into bigger crimes, they escalate into bigger claims because they want that they want more and more attention and maybe after a while the ones they're saying aren't getting enough attention so you got to ratchet it up so i do believe she suffered from munchausen not again not suffered exhibited i believe she likely had a borderline personality disorder she had a high level of narcissism because look at this for example she was very pretty but here, you know she married a guy much older than her who was already married why is because he was easier to manipulate, to, to pull in. I'm not sure. Uh, but she has two more men in her life, at least, uh, maybe even two, at least two more that are way older than her. Uh, and so I have a feeling she, maybe it's a father thing she was going after, but she obviously could, you know, uh, just to be fair, I don't know how many guys are here, but, <clears throat> you know, I'm 66. I can get a guy who's 86. <laughs> I can't get it. It's hard for me to get a guy who's 66. He can get a woman who's 46 because let's face it, guys like younger women because they're hotter. Okay. So he's, he's now 18 years older than her. His, his wife is, you know, getting up there. And then he's got this hot babe and she was good looking. There's no question about it. A very attractive woman. She could have been, in, she could have been in movies, maybe Alfred Hitchcock movies, but you know, it's easier for her to get him than anybody else. And he's already established as money, blah, blah, blah. And so she tended to lean toward older guys. And I think it's because she could manipulate them because they were so entranced by her. And, you know, if you're, a, if you're narcissistic, you want people to be entranced by you instead of like having a, you know, a level playing field or anything like that. Well, that's an interesting point. She wanted to be a trophy wife. Eh, perhaps, you know, look, my, my guy is this. He's not just a college student. He's this. And, you know, he chose me over his wife. No, there's, a, there's an interesting psychological thing that goes on there. Um, so. Oh, well, that's an interesting one. Uh, uh, Doreen says, I heard of a case of DID where she committed suicide by having other set her on fire. You know, I, I you know I'm not going to comment on the um, the disassociative disassociative identity disorder, you, which was split personality. You know, three faces of Eve, three personalities, things like that. Um, I don't really quite understand it myself. That there really is a part of you that has no idea what the other part is doing. I think that's so bizarre. I can't I can't even wrap my head around it. Tell you the truth. So yeah, it could be, or or the one side could be just going. They bought that? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. So, but anyway, let's go on with the story. So, oh, oh, this is a good one, Steve. I'm glad you mentioned that. Did she want children? Did she have a maternal instinct? 
Steve, I looked this up everywhere. She never had children with her husband or anybody else. And I wonder, she's working with abused children, so she loves, supposedly loves children. You know, sometimes Munchausen and people like to manipulate children, but they also relate to them. So I looked that up and that drove me nuts. I could not find anything about it. I knew she didn't have any, but why not? Was she unable to have children? Did her new or did her husband say, look, I already had two kids. I'm not doing that again. Was she afraid to have children because of her own upbringing? Or did she just not want those little buzzards in her way? And I do not know the answer to that. And I wish I did. And that's very, very annoying. Um, and that's, I, I can't get it. Maybe if I could buy the $400, $500 book, I'd know. All right, let's go on. All right, so all these incidents. Eight months after Cindy's death, her case went to coroner's court, which I thought was very interesting. And this part, this is very kind of funny later. We're going to end with a coroner's court. And, and my thing about jury system is going to be there. Um, jurors are presented with evidence as to the death, and they determine what was the issue. And in this inquest, they came up with death by unknown event, which is where that book idea came from. So let's go on. Um, in October 7th of 1982, Cindy was home alone and she, she started getting these phone calls. And these, so what she claims were these creepy phone calls. Okay, so, um, and she was getting these letters put on her car and you know notes stuck on things and all kinds of weird stuff going on. And she claimed some stranger came into the yard, yelled Jimbo, and ran away. Okay. Um, and so, but she's getting these phone calls now that say weird things, you know, like, bitch, die, and all that kind of stuff. And and these weird, weird collages with, with words on them and stuff. Now, let me ask you this question. And this, this, is, this is one of my first questions that popped into my head. She's getting these phone calls. And she's answering the phone and this weird dude is on there saying these creepy things to her over and over again. What would you do as a single, now single woman living by herself? What would you choose to do about these phone calls? What would be something rational to do? What is your thought on that? Now, while I'm waiting... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> does does Jimbo mean anything in particular? You know, and I want to point out. Uh, oh, geez, did I? Uh oh, did I put you in timeout? Oh, hold on a second. Um, wait a minute. Well, let me get to you in a second, Christine. The Jimbo thing. <laughs> now, one of the things I noticed in this case, and I'm pay attention to this, that if you were truly a male stalker, or you were trying to scare her, or you were trying to kill her, or whatever you're trying to do. Would you do goofy crap? I mean, this is so much goofy crap. I'm like, who runs into the backyard going, Jimbo? How? What What does that even mean? What does that make sense? Sometimes when people have Munchausen's, they come up with these crazy stories trying to, to suck you in, but they don't make a whole lot of sense. So one of the things I noticed with a lot of these crimes is they were so weird that you're like, who does this kind of thing? I don't know many male stalkers or male people trying to scare people who would do things like this. It makes no sense. So that's one of the red flags that I came up with. Um, oh, here. Okay. Recording them. Okay. Doreen, she called the police. Believe me. After the fifth one, she called the police. And so this is the beginning of when she started going to talking to all the police. Um, record them. That's an interest. No, I, this is 1982. And quite frankly, was around obviously in 1982 and I was an adult in 1982, but I don't remember what devices we had. Um, but yes, I think we had tape recorders. I would have a tape recorder right by the damn phone and I'd be tape recording the crap out of those phone calls. She did not do that. All right, let's see. Um, okay, change number or move. She did do that and guess what? Immediately, as soon as she moved, changed her number, they, the call started again. They found her wherever she was. Oh, there we go. Nicole, I would hang up, blop, or get someone else to answer. Ding, bingo. Because one of the things she never, ever had, guess what she never had? Witnesses. Because if, if, if I'm picking up this phone, people keep saying creepy things to me. I'm going to ask my sister to hang in here. I'm going to sneak a friend in. I'm, I'm going to do something to have somebody else always answer that damn phone. Because I want somebody else to tell the police, hey, she's not lying. 
there's some creepy dude calling and I was there in the room with her. I answered the phone because I'm a female. So if a male answers the phone, he could just hang up, right? But if a female answers it, he's not going to tell the difference. My sister sounds just like me. As a matter of fact, one time she left a message and I thought it was me. <laughs> I'm like, why am I calling myself? I'm like, oh, oh, that's not me. <laughs> so I would have my sister hiding in there, answering the phone. Because if I really want the police to believe me, I really want this to stop. I'm going to find that way to do this. And she did not do this, which I found rather interesting. Um, yep, that's exactly it. Have someone spend a lot of time at your house so they can hear it too. Um, yeah, this th 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 was landline days, so you can't just block things. So it is harder in the landline days to do that. You keep having to change your phone number, but you can, I thought you could change it to unlisted. So when she moved and it became unlisted, how did immediately somebody find her? So now this is a good one. Okay. Hello. This is another good one. The answering machine would have recorded easily back then. Interestingly enough, you'll hear this later in the show. Roy, her husband, also had a call from the creepo. He recorded it on the answering machine. And I'll, that will play that. I'll play that for you later because it's very fascinating. Um, so yes, you could definitely do that. Um, so to that, those are the most important things I think right there, which I thought was odd. Anyway, she was 38 years old and newly separated from her husband, Roy Makepeace of 16 years. He was a psychiatrist. Well, he kind of failed some level of it and he went into other work. They were on a trial separation and they were on good terms and they still saw each other once a week. He left, he stayed in the house and she moved and rented the first floor of a house in a working class neighborhood. She moved in over the summer and made a garden. All right. The voice was a man who never identified himself. And with each call, the threats got more threatening and more explicit. According to the PI she hired, Ozzy, who we're going to get to, she received nine phone calls between October 7th and 14th. On the morning of the 15th, she went to the bank. And when she got home, her back door was unchained, unlocked and ajar. It looked like someone had thrown a rock through the window of the back door. Nothing was taken. Now, what's the first thing you think about that particular first, that first incident where not only she's, she's getting phone calls, but somebody has attacked her home. What, what about that tells you that it's, a, that it's an outsider and not her? Is there anything? Or could she have done that herself? Think about that for a second. Four nights later, she went out again. When she got home, she found her pillowcase slashed slash a pillowcase was slashed a dozen stabs through the pillow and one of her house keys was on the floor she called her husband to say she was terrified and then she called the cops um so again this is something she could do herself it's very and so the police come and they're like well okay you got a stabbed up pillowcase but somebody stabbed up your pillow but what does that mean so he, somehow he had to access the house and they saw no, no sign of, you know, somebody breaking into the house. Okay. So now somebody theoretically is trying to scare her. Scary phone calls, nasty words. I don't like it. You know, horrible things about calling her names. Exactly. Molly, this is true. She could have done all of it. Keep your, keep your mind on that. Let's keep going. All right. So now, okay. So a guy named, uh, a guy named Andy Richard between 1988, and 1999, was a member of the Vancouver Police Department. He partnered with a guy named Patrick McBride, who's going to be called Pat from now on. We went to call at Cindy's and she opened the door and was friendly and showed them the pillow, told them about the calls and the other break-ins. Became apparent there was a stalker. Filed a report. Next night, he noticed that Pat was in a better mood than usual. We're going in for coffee at Cindy's. <laughs> now, mind you, okay, Andy is, 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 a, is a new recruit. So he's like 23 years old. Pat was not a new recruit. He was a lot older. So again, the older man is going after Cindy because she's hot. I mean, let's face it, before she went downhill and looks because she became middle-aged and she became anorexic and had she can't start looking like crap, she was a, she was a looker. Um, it became a regular thing, coffee and donuts with Cindy. Pat became obsessed with Cindy and Cindy's case, and he wanted to spend all the time patrolling the area of her home. Which is interesting because, first of all, he's, he should be fired right there. But, okay, he wasn't. He was fired later. Um, 
He con it continued for two weeks. Then Pat told Andy he was moving in with Cindy. He left, leaving his wife. <laughs> well, you're supposedly already leaving his wife. Uh, and needed a place to stay. He would get a room and Cindy would get protection around the clock. All right. While living with Cindy, he installed deadbolts and got her to change her phone number and to leave it unlisted. Supposedly, someone in the neighborhood claimed that other women had gotten strange phone calls and seen a strange man. Here we got, we got rumors here. Um, he asked the, let's see, she didn't receive any strange calls for a while. I wonder why. Oh, yeah. Officer Pat is in my house. Um, yeah. Um, Pat answered one and he only heard heavy breathing. Now, oh, oh, right here. Okay, this is a great one. So Pat one day answers the phone. He hears. <sighs> now, what is the question you would like to ask about that issue? Because this is what came up right, right in my head and the podcast didn't bother to answer it. What would be the first question? He picked up the phone. He heard heavy breathing. What do you think? Right there. What's your question? If you were investigated, what would your next question be? And while I'm waiting for that answer, no, there was never fingerprints or a sign of forced entry or footprints. Zero, zero, and zero. Yeah, so. Uh, oh, why no talking? Hmm, that's a good question, Doreen. So he just hears heavy breathing. Person on the other end doesn't want to use their voice when they always use their voice other times and say nasty things. Why isn't that person using their voice? Ah, there we go. That's it. That's my, that's, that's the answer. What? Yep. Where's Cindy? Wait a minute. This question, Maria said, was she at home? That was my question. I'm like, okay, so you're telling me he's hearing heavy breathing, which is giving me the idea that, okay, then maybe there really is a stalker. But then I'm like, where's Cindy? <laughs> because Cindy's probably, is Cindy at the store? Stopped at a telephone booth, called home, and went, <sighs> you know. But the podcast doesn't answer that. That is disingenuous, in my opinion, and wrong. Because if you're trying to be an ethical podcast, you should be telling me what the answer to that question is, and don't just give me give me give me nonsense. Um, so, um, <laughs> Moon Child says Darth Vader is jealous, perhaps. <laughs> All right, Let, let's go on. All right, so the call was traced to a nearby suburb, but not a specific address, probably because it was a paid telephone. I don't know. Pat had no leads, but he had a theory. Now, it was her ex, Roy, her ex-husband. Now, this is very interesting. See, Pat is her He's like, he's enamored by her. See, she's very good because she's good looking. I mean, it does help. She's small. She's thin at that. You know, she's dresses nicely. She's clever and she's good looking. So older guy follows, falls for her. And he's totally smitten with her. Therefore, she can convince him pretty much of anything. So all of a sudden he decides it's her ex. One time they did see the ex sitting in a car behind her home. He claimed he was planning to surprise whoever was stalking Cindy. Again, I don't know if this is true. Maybe he just drove by one day. I don't know. Maybe he was coming to and was waiting for her to arrive home because he was going to talk to her. I don't know. No information. Did surveillance of the ex. Pat became obsessed with her and spent all his time with Cindy or doing surveillance. Here comes an interesting part. One month after Pat moved in, Cindy got tired of him <laughs> and told him to move out. Now, what do you think a good reason for Cindy wanting him to go away at this point? Why do you think this is an issue of him being in her home? You know, good old Pat. He believed her. He's after her ex. Why would she? Um, unless, I mean, well, I mean, waiting, I'm waiting on that answer. Um, couldn't the PI be contributing to this because he was, she was smitten on him? Uh, good. This actually, Christine, this is a reasonable question. Some did question whether, she was able to hook guys into her sphere that would do stuff for her to make her look innocent. Uh, and that's a good question. I don't see any evidence of that. Um, so no, I don't see any evidence, but you know, could have happened. And some people try to think it would happen. Uh, oh yeah, there we go. All right. Um, she can't harass him with him around the house. Can't harass herself with him around the house. Steve says 
she couldn't continue the Munchausen's with him around, right? Uh, forever young. He's got a buster story. <laughs> Molly, she was he was ruining her game. This is great. <laughs> okay, this is making me laugh. <laughs> Doreen says she missed stalking herself. <laughs> she probably did. I mean, she's do if she is doing this, she's doing it because she craves the attention and then this this asshole is living in her house and she's trying to like suck him in to get her to believe her, her but dang it he's always around he's like ah it's like a it's ruining ruining the party yeah and as sandra says cramping her stuff <laughs> absolutely so those are that was the thought that came to my mind all right so she got tired and told him to move out however they continued dating all right and even double dated with his ex and his new partner because <laughs> the, the, so the ex moved the new girlfriend in and I, I don't know. I don't know the whole story there and nobody's ever really told it, but now they're double dating. I'm going to say she's double dating so she can see her ex-husband. I think she's obsessed with her ex-husband. Pat and Roy compare theories. Pat and Roy continue to see each other for years. Roy stopped by quite often and cops said they saw him circling. I don't know if that's true. Now the stalking is escalating. Phone calls, stuff left on the front lawn. Now pay attention to the things happening here again. Could she do this herself or this, would this have to be somebody else? Phone calls, stuff left on the front lawn, porch light bulbs unscrewed, collages with cut out words, some bad words. One morning she found a photo of an actress who looked like her with her throat slashed and ink mimicking blood. Water poured on garden lights, killing them. What do you think? Kind of, I, I, I'm going to say kind of easy. You know what I mean? Kind of easy. These are, these are not big things. I mean, I can go out, I can go out and cause like a little, whole bunch of little weird stuff to my house. Um, very easily, you know, I, to go turn a bulb off is not a big deal. Um, these are very simple things. So now anyway, um, so during, from January 83 to her death, to 89 other 80 minor events and a dozen major events all right that was part that was only part one all right now we get the first major event um i went out to the garage the first time now i by the way there's like three different versions of this and i don't know if she told three different stories but they don't match uh, i put the light on and got three boxes about five minutes, I went back to the garage. So she got the three boxes, supposedly brought them in the house. And then she went back to the garage. This is the first story. I pushed the door open, took a few steps in the garage and realized the light was in the thing. So she said on, but it was off. The light was off. It was dark. I turned to leave and I was grabbed by my right arm. I said, oh my God, it's happening. And he said, shut up. A deep, low male voice around 9 p.m. on the 27th. Chris, Cindy's friend Agnes, called to say she was stopping by. She got there 20 minutes later. Now, this is one of the big interesting things about some of these particular cases. Now, what was happening? Who was supposed to be coming by? Agnes. Did she know Agnes was going to be coming by and therefore stage this in a reasonable amount of time so that she would be found fairly quickly? Because Agnes was stopping by. All right. Uh, she's, she, she, she knocked on the door. There was no answer. As she was standing there debating what to do, she heard moaning. She saw Cindy slump in an outdoor stairwell that goes down to the basement. She was incoherent, moaning, struggling to believe. I'm sorry, not believe. Breathe. She was struggling to breathe. Her clothes were cut with one arm of her white blouse shredded and the shoulder and back ripped off. Her jeans and socks were saturated with blood. A black nylon stocking was wrapped around her throat. Now, this is very important because almost every case of her being attacked, there's a signature black stocking around her throat, which I want to point out right here, something interesting. There are very few cases, even serial killer cases, that use a signature like that. I mean, did she, did she read too much, you know, uh, 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 the Boston Strangler crap, you know, and that's where the idea came from? I don't know, but very rarely does... Uh, somebody attacking really care that they leave some signature that, Oh, you have to know it's me then. Because I would assume if somebody attacked me a number of times in different ways, I'd pretty much assume it was still the same guy. They don't have to leave a signature. But anyway, she had a black 
stalking around her throat. So tight, Agnes could get her, couldn't hard try, try getting her finger under it. Apparently not entirely tight enough to completely strangle her. So if the guy wanted her dead, which most of these kind of guys do, you just kind of strangle the person. You know, <coughs> take care of it. She'll be dead. She wasn't dead. She's somehow alive. So um, Agnes knocked on the door of the downstairs apartment. Now, the downstairs apartment somebody else lives in, the neighbor apparently never heard anything. <laughs> so, you know, this, this is happening. She's being attacked, and he never heard a thing. Anyway, um, so they cut the stocking off her neck. She had 14 scrapes and cuts, including a 14-inch gash above her ankle. My question is this. Uh, uh, yeah, she said it. Did Agnes call the police? Oh, yeah, she went to the hospital. So there was she wanted her to go to the hospital. I mean, she went to the hospital every time she had a major attack because she had injuries and she always went into comas. Um, so what what is the one thing that women who hurt themselves do not usually touch? What is the one part of their body when women do damage to themselves that they do not actually mess up. Can somebody tell me? Can somebody tell me? What's the one thing women never touch? There you go. Thank you, Carrie. Face. Exactly. Uh, yeah, the face. And everybody else has face now. Face, 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 face. Yes, this is absolutely correct. <laughs> well, okay, genitals. Yeah, she had actually something stuck up them, but yeah. <laughs> um, their hair, no, sometimes they'll chop their hair off. No, that's not true. It is definitely the face. Benny says, where they put their makeup on. Well, I guess it depends where you put your makeup on. Mm, okay, maybe if you're an adult actress, it goes other places. But yes, the face. The, oftentimes when you see, for example, a man commit uh, suicide with a gun, he'll do this. Women don't like to do that. They like to, they, they're more likely to do this because they don't want their face to go, you know, and be found with their face messed up. They want their face to be intact. So it's a very female thing. Um, and so as we go through these crimes, one thing you'll notice is her face is always intact. As a matter of fact, on the, the final crime where she dies, although she ended up with a you know, decomposition, turning her face black, which wasn't, you know, she was all decomposed. She actually had a, um, she actually went and got a makeover that day. So yes, but women don't want their faces messed up. Now, on the other hand, on the other hand, remember, remember the Black Dahlia thing I did last week? What did that dude do? He wanted to punish her. He cut her mouth. He slashed her face. If you want to hurt a woman, cut her face. This guy supposedly hates her that much, stalking her. He finally gets her. He grabs her. He half strangles her because he doesn't want to bother to strangle her all the way because he wants to keep her alive so she can enjoy his attentions. Why not a little cut? Why not a little X on the on the on the old cheek? You know why not a little cut down here? Why doesn't he do anything to her face? Apparently he does not. Um. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I was being a smart ass by saying hair. <laughs> that, you know, she didn't mess with her hair either, though. So I don't know that you're entirely wrong on that. OK, let's go ahead. All right. So she told police she was moving back. OK, now, by, uh, let me tell you the other couple stories. The other couple stories were she was leaving her house and she got toward the garage door. She noticed the light was off and the door was in a different position. This is a different version of the story. But in spite of the fact that the light being off and the door being in a different position and the fact that she was being stalked by some creepy dude who was hanging around her house, she goes ahead, opens the door to the dark garage and was it a cassette was about yeah, garage. And she goes in the dark garage, even though she suspects somebody could be in there. Really? Okay. That's nonsensical. So she's that terrified of a stalker being around the house. She would not be, she would not do that. Uh, the second, the second, the third story is she was leaving her house and two guys attacked her and pulled her into the garage and said all kinds of horrible things to her. The story changed, and that's always an indication of something's not not 
accurate about this particular story. Now, there one other thing. Oh, here's her. Now, here's the rest of the information on this. All right. Um, oh, okay. The second time when she was the, had the guy, the thing was open and she decided to go in anyway. Before she could figure out what went on, she was grabbed from behind and felt a pinprick in her right shoulder. Police did find a needle mark in her arm. Apparently, she's kept getting these needle marks in her arm. Now, she's a nurse, and she knows how to use a hypodermic needle. And then uh, and the, then the locations of the needle marks seem to change. And uh, Somebody said because she got stabbed, and she's a right-handed person, because she got stabbed in the right shoulder, oh, my God, she, she, she couldn't be her. Okay, I'm sorry, but, you know. Putting a needle mark in yourself is not that hard. So a lot of them are also in a like a in the right arm. So you could, I mean, I'm right-handed, but I can pick up a needle and go like that too. Not that hard. Um, okay. The they found, but this is interesting. They found a smear of blood on the wall in the outdoor basement stairwell, which she was down in. But they also found a bloody mark in the the cardboard box in the garage. Okay, I'm, I'm okay with that. Nothing else was touched. They found blood on the bathroom counter inside her house as well. That was the only blood in the house. Would somebody like to explain to me why there was blood in her bathroom counter? Um, that that was a theory, by the way. Anne says a like, needle from her ex because he was a shrink. He really wasn't doing that kind of work anyway anymore, um, but... She had she worked hospitals and stuff. She had a lot of access to that. And she actually did have, by the way, when they when after she was dead and her family went to the house, there were there were needles in her house. So she did have the needles. Um, yes. It, oh, sorry. Wait a minute. It was a detached garage. Yes, it was out in the back. Correct. Oh, that's interesting. Lifted her leg to cut it. Hmm. That might, might that might have been what what happened. Yes. Um, could it be hygiene related? I don't think so. I think this is the problem the police had because they're like, if she was attacked only outside and in the garage, there should not be blood on the bathroom counter. So she had to have done something to herself before she went out to out into the quote the garage or down into the stairwell. So they were very suspicious because there's no reason why blood should have been inside the house. Um, well, probably not. I mean, I'm sure there was enough blood. I'm sure that it didn't look like shaving leg blood or brushing teeth blood. I mean, it was her blood. Yes. Um, so it's hard to say, but that I just want to point out, that's why they were suspicious because they saw blood inside the house. Um, they found no sign of a struggle, no fingerprints, no sign of forced entry, no trace of any other human beings, just her, her. So that's the, that's, this is the first major attack. So I'm just pointing this out because that's why the police, the police did investigate in spite of what the post said of the show. She did investigate. So, um, yes and no, I don't think blood in her bathroom is indicative of suspicion. Yes. You have to, you have to think about it depending on the location of it. And, and the fact that it was still left there, it wasn't cleaned up. When was it left there? They have to consider it. Now, yeah, you're coming up with all these these good reasons, but um, yes, we do bleed. But you know, it's honest to God, I don't know about you, ladies, but I usually leave blood on my 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 counter that often. <laughs> could it happen? Yes, it could. But um, but that's why the police were suspicious. Now, totality of evidence. I talk about that all the time. No sign of a struggle. Her story didn't make sense. And there's blood on her bathroom counters. So did it happen? Did she hurt herself inside and then go outside? That's the question. And we don't know. But they they looked into a stranger and they couldn't come up with one is the point. Okay, let's go on. All right. Now, there's the, the let me see. What's her name? The woman who runs the show. Okay, the woman who runs the show is Pamela Adlon. I'm trying to remember who she is. Pamela Adlon now says, this attack to Cindy's, this attack took Cindy's terror to a new level. Well, Clearly, she wanted you to believe it was at a new level because obviously before it was just phone calls and creepy stuff and a few you know, a rock through the window and the stab pillow. But now she herself has been attacked. This is horrific. So, by the way, um, Roy, because of this incident, offered her house back and said he would move out 
she said, okay, so she actually moved back into the, the, the marriage house and he moved out. Now, mind you, he he's becomes a suspect over and over in this case, but he gave her the house back. So that's just point, something to point out. Um, the patrolman labeled as attempted murder. Um, and now they added a different guy to the case, a guy named David Bauer Smith. All right. So let me go. Let me. Oh, this this is kind of funny. Just to point this out. The sister who wants to paint her paint San, Cindy, who is her oldest sister, as the most wonderful person in the world. She claims that at three years old, she remembers her sister arriving at the airport in France and how she ran to her and hugged her because she missed her so much. She was amazing to me and read me stories and listened to all my questions and laid on the grass and we looked at clouds and made animal shapes of them. She's three. <laughs> I don't think so. Maybe somebody told you that's what happened, but I'm going to say you just want to believe your sister is this wonderful person. Okay. Anyway, by the way, Cindy was not a blonde to begin with. She was brunette. She became a blonde. So when she moved from uh, when she moved to become a, a nurse, she uh, she was five foot four, very petite, um, and she became a blonde. And she was sort of like you know finding her own place. Uh, when she met Roy, they snuck around sleeping at hotels. And a few months into the affair, a colleague saw them kissing, which apparent which is interesting because supposedly what broke up their marriage was an, a colleague of hers later on where she worked saw him kissing another woman. <laughs> The one he ended up supposedly with. They uh, so um, and then it, the wife filed for divorce. So that, that was uh, 196. Wait a minute. They saw each other for a year and three days after the divorce, and then they got married. The father was shocked and didn't like it very much. But anyway, they got they get they got over it. Anyway, Melanie thought they had the perfect marriage. That's the older. That's the younger sister. Um, they bought a house and a boat. They sailed and garden. Cindy had a fear of water, but she loved gardening. All right. And then she got her, Cindy, in the early 70s, got her position, her new position at a house for disturbed children called Blendheim. I'm probably botching that. I keep forgetting what it's actually pronounced like Blendheim. She became part of the management team. Everybody, they, people asked her for advice, uh, but she never really told them what was happening in her life. Okay. Then they saw a change happening. Um, when they, after they separated, uh, they the co-workers helped her move. Uh, and Cindy got that main floor of the house where she got the first threatening phone calls. And then she started having very strange behavior changes, tremendous weight loss. She smoked a lot more. She was edgy, brittle. She had anger, but she never talked about it much. Toward the end of 1983 was when she was attacked in the garage and she arrived with a black eye and no good explanation. She wouldn't give any details. She didn't tell coworkers she had been harassed or that the police were working on it. All right. Um, Oh, is this, this is, oh, this is a whole, this is a whole nother story. Um, he, the guy, the, now the story about the garage is the guy told her he will take a long time to die. She never does, you know, except for the last time she never, you know, if a guy really wants to kill her, he would obviously kill her, but for some reason she doesn't. Anyway, um, she took, the detectives didn't believe the story. So they asked her to take a polygraph. She agreed. Uh, and she failed the polygraph. A week later, she took another polygraph and she failed again. Now, this gets interesting here. Um, now, people can fail polygraphs for other reasons, so let's not get into all the polygraphs and no good discussion, but she did fail too, which is interesting. All right. The examiner didn't know if she was lying or just withholding information. So later on, the the, the, the guy named Ozzy, the, the detective, just believed she was withholding information because she knew the man but was afraid to admit it. And there's two theories of who the man was. One is that it was her ex-husband and the other that it was some, later on you'll find some, some psychiatrist running this, this gang of psychiatrists who abuses women and kills them. Um, but she didn't want to admit it. And this, but was afraid to say so because she was afraid the guy would attack her family. Okay. I have a problem with this. So the claim is she, every time things happen, she never gave a full story. And the police always were suspicious because she never had details. Most of the time she said she couldn't remember anything. Oh, the old, I can't remember anything story, uh, which, which is the same one I, uh, on one of the other videos with the, uh, the, the woman who was found in a closet after 16 hours when they found her in the closet and she was tied up and they, she told the police, 
I couldn't remember anything for 16 hours. I don't know what happened. Couldn't remember anything. You know, one of the advantages of not remembering anything is you, you can't screw up the story. You can't you say one thing and then change your mind. So she couldn't remember anything. But they thought she was withholding evidence because she was afraid if she spoke out about this person, they would hurt her, her mother and her sister. Which I find kind of amusing because she spends all her time calling the police. So if you were worried about this guy going after your mother and sister, why the hell do you keep con contacting the police over and over and over again? Why do you have the police move into your house? You know, and you are talking to the police. They bring you to the hospital. They know the police are there. How are you protecting your mother and sister by not saying anything when you're constantly telling everybody somebody's trying to attack you? It's, it's a very strange story. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and then the one other thing about that is this. If you wanted to stop her from talking, and we're going to get into the whole crazy story about why she supposedly had to keep her mouth shut over some weird incident with her ex-husband, which is so bizarre, it's just unbelievable. But if she, if a guy wanted her to keep her mouth shut, all he has to do is grab her one time, beat the hell out of her, and say, shut the hell up. Don't contact the police. Don't talk to journalists. Don't tell your family. Just shut the hell up. You do it one time. And then you're like, damn, I don't want to be beat up again. I don't want my family beat up. I'm not going to talk to the police. That's what usually happens. And then everything goes quiet because you shut the hell up. She never shut the hell up. She made <laughs> report after report after report and have police all over the place. So this is a stupid story. And uh, it bothers me that in during during the, uh, the podcast, no one said, that don't make any sense. <laughs> Why would she shut up? Why would she shut up if... You know, there, you know, that makes no sense. Ah, anyway, let me see what uh, Florence has to say. Just to cover all bases, what about the theory that she had a drug problem and had been supplying hospital drugs to some shady characters who were periodically threatening her? There's zero proof of it. That's the problem. There's so many theories and not a shred of proof. And, you know, when you do investigations, you usually do see there's, you know, connections to things, uh, suspicious behaviors outside of what she's doing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So, yeah, this is this is the this is the claim uh, multiple, multiple personality disorder now called DID. I don't believe it. I believe she's Munchausen's and she knows exactly what she's doing. She's very calculated. She has to plan this incredibly long. These these crimes. She's got to plan them very carefully. I don't believe that somebody who half the time doesn't know what their other side is doing is that clever and that calculated. I don't buy it. I believe that is that is a sign of Munchausen's where they figure out exactly what their whole story is going to be. And then they, they set it up, they plan it, they get materials to do it. They, I mean, Munchausen's people, there's a lot of cases where you won't believe the stuff they go through to, to, to make their claims. They, they worked very hard on it. Okay, let's go back. Okay, so anyway, she moves back to the house and less than a week later, she moves back out again. And she starts getting more threatening letters and phone calls. One morning, she found the porch light smashed. Next morning, lights in the garden, oh, killed in the garden. She moves out three months later and buys a bungalow closer to work. A bungalow closer to work. Now, again, if you were being harassed to that level, what would you probably want to do rather than get a bungalow, a detached house? What would you more likely do? You know, how do you keep safer? <laughs> well, when does she have the time? Well, she likes gardening, but it doesn't mean you know, people have lots of time. You go to work, you come home, you've got hours to cut up little magazine things. So what am I going to do next? These, these things aren't happening every day. So she can plan something and then one night just go out and smash lights and throw water around and put a, put a picture on her car and then call the police. It's not that hard to do. Um, there we go. There's a good, there's an interesting idea, an apartment around people. Now, maybe nobody wants to live with her because she supposedly has a stalker, but you know, she could put an ad in a newspaper. They, people wouldn't know any better. She could get a you know, three's company thing, get an apartment with three people in it and where you have security and then you would at least be in a better situation. Um, you know, of course, that doesn't mean she wouldn't be attacked going to her car or coming out of work. But if she's trying to provide security where she lives, 
she could do that. So that, you know, that's, that's a, that's a better possibility. Now I always find this kind of funny. If you were being, now she's got, this is only the first of the attacks. Let me go to the other ones and then I'll ask you this question, which I'm going to hold off for a second. All right. So anyway, uh, so Pat, she called Pat again. He, he didn't quite move in, but he came over every day. He put in locks. Then he went away for the, uh, they went away to a cabin for the weekend. So I'm going to say, they never talk about her having sex with these guys, but I'm going to say they're not going to hang around if they're not getting some. Um, later in a diary, she wrote that Pat wasn't helping her and was more over-focused on her. How dare he? Um, and, you know, rather than the, the harasser. In other words, when he's around, he just like messes up her whole plan. She wrote him a letter asking him to uh, calm down and back off. But he told her he loved her and wanted to protect her. Her ex was also trying to come to help with no luck. Towards the end of 1998, she flew to Indonesia for two weeks to visit her brother, and she came back revived. Keep that in mind. She went to Indonesia for two weeks. Her brother lived in Indonesia. She had family in other parts of the, parts of the world. She, when she was away to her brother, she was never bothered. Okay, I'm going to stop right here. She's got two more attacks before she's killed or, or dies of suicide or accident. Two more horrific attacks. What would you do if somebody had brutally attacked you three times, attempted to rape you, you ended up in the hospital, you're strangled, they threatened your family? What might you think you should do at that point? Maybe even the first time it happens. What, what good idea, what would a normal person might think they should do? Somebody got an idea on that one. And while I'm waiting for that answer, Nicole says, if all that happened, I wouldn't be comfortable living on my own. Yes. If you, you know, she insisted on living on her own, essentially. Well, got a gun. Well, that's a good idea. But apparently she never had a chance to reach for guns because there we go. Thank you for that answer. Steve, move away from the area. Because if you've got a guy who's right there, threatening you right in your home. And if you move, you know, a few blocks away in the city, he's still there. You move to the other side of the city, he's still there. She's a nurse. She's highly valuable. I mean, I know you love your job, Cindy, but the guy's trying to either torture you or kill you or, and threatening to kill your family. I would get the hell out of Dodge. Move, move across the United States, move to Hawaii, move to Indonesia. You will have a job. And if it happens over there, you'd have to wonder who's getting on an airplane and coming that far to, to harass you. Or would all the attacks just stop? Or you know, would she continue them and then claim the guy crossed the, crossed the ocean? But a normal person at some point would go away. Go and stay with your brother. There, whoops, get a guard dog. She had a little puppy. Teeny little puppy. Um, go stay with your brother. Why not? Get protection. Well, she did by the getting a... a a police officer there, but she got tired of him. You see, get, get the hell out of Dodge. This went on for seven years. Move to a creepy, <laughs> move to a creepy cabin in the woods. <laughs> Benny says, get out of town like a bat out of hell. Yeah. At some point. Yeah. <laughs> I've crossed oceans of time to find you. <laughs> He's a time traveler now. <laughs> I like it. So yeah, normal person at some point would say, I got to make, I got to make a better plan than getting another detached home where I keep getting attacked right in the same town. You know, much as I love my town, my job, whatever, I'm going to die. My family's going to die. So if, if she's not committing the crimes, she should have done obviously way more to protect herself and she didn't do it. So anyway, let's go on. Uh, okay. Now, then we, now, episode three starts with P.I. Ozzy. He, he's a, a freaking nut, in my opinion. He He's posed with many famous politicians and movie stars. He was a bodyguard, blah, blah, blah. And he says this. If a person is not honest with me, I won't work with her. I know for sure she was honest. Except later on, he says, well, she didn't tell us everything. That's called being dishonest. That's called, oh, well, she didn't lie. No, she was dishonest. You said you wanted honesty. You're full of crap. You were you were, you had a thing for her too, but I bet Ozzy. She was just really good at playing guys, I think. So anyway, this is interesting. He gave her a two-way radio system. Say, and he, she's supposed to say, Cindy, help, if she needed him. About six weeks later, on January 20th, on 1984, 
there was a there was a a a, a call. I got right there. The windows were tight. The doors were locked. When I looked through the crack, I saw her there on the floor. I broke the door down. I thought the person or persons were still in the house. I saw a lot of blood and the little dog was under the table. He called for an ambulance. He thought she was dead. Let me let me show you the sort of the basic thing here. Um, the basic crime scene here. Let me just show you where so there was there was definitely blood. Because here's blood. Okay, here's blood in the house. Oh, I'm sitting in front of the blood. Wow. Don't you hate it when you're... Okay, hold on one second. Ready? See blood? Blood on the floor. Where the hell did it go? Now it's, now it's behind my chair. <laughs> Damn it. Picked the wrong picture. <laughs> my chair is blocking the blood. It's on the kitchen floor. Oh, my God. I can't believe it. Okay, so anyway... <laughs> I I run such a crap, uh, messed up show. I tell you, I have fun doing it. Um, okay, so anyway, there's blood on the floor. Now, she was. He, then he found her body, uh, and 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 the detective arrived. He examined the body and she found she was still breathing on the kitchen floor, surrounded by smears of blood. Paramedics found a stocking tied so tightly around her neck it was hidden by the folds in her neck. But again, this was a stretchy stocking. This is. Interestingly enough, it never is enough to kill her. Usually when a, say a killer wants to kill somebody, he's going to stay there until she's dead with that damn stocking. He's not going to just put the stocking around and then go, okay, you're still breathing. So even if it's tight, it doesn't mean you can't breathe. So it's, it's always interesting how she's never dead from the damn stocking. Um, now, uh, a knife was sticking out. There's a knife. There's a knife. Okay, there was a knife. It's a kitchen knife. It's, it's a paring knife which again is kind of interesting because usually a guy comes in to chop the up is I'm going to, I'm going to bring myself a hunting knife, but you know, it's a tiny little paring knife. Anyway, it was stuck in her hand, her left hand. I think that's her left. It's supposed to be a left hand. So anyway, I don't, you know, it, I don't know how much it was stuck in her hand. This is some, this is something I don't understand either. Was it, I saw something that said it was through her hand, but I'm I'm looking at this wondering, was it through her hand or was it just in her hand, like an inch? I can't quite figure that out. And on the note, there was this uh, paper note on it that said, you die next. Well, I'm going to say, why don't you die now? I've got a stocking around you and a knife, but I'm not going to kill you. I'm just going to tell you you're going to die next. What do you mean? Who else has died? Why are you dying next? I, I don't understand that. All right. She's got some injuries on Let's see. Uh, okay. She's got a little, you know, she's got some scratches on her arm. And here is her face. Okay, look at her face. Remember what I just said? I think she's got a scratch on her forehead underneath where her hair would be. But that's it. I mean, she's not cut up. She's got a knife through her hand. Why not cut her face? Why not cut her face? You know, I find that fascinating. So anyway that's her that that's 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 this guy now it's ozzy's over there and uh where's where's my picture where's my picture of ozzy um you know, when they interviewed him for the show he's like 80 some years old and he's like you can barely hear what he's saying but he used to look like this at the time he was a tough guy you know and um he was there and he said my god she's been attacked they examined the floor kitchen. One chair was dripping blood. One smear stretched 10 feet across the floor down the hallway, which, by the way, was where she called him from. Um, apparently, it looked like she had been crawling on her hands and knees, and someone caught her near the sink and stabbed her in the hand. Uh, one officer said that it looked like someone had tried to mop up the blood. Why would they do that? Okay, Ozzy told the officers that Cindy was wearing a coat at the time of the attack and that she struggled to get to the two-way radio to call him and smear blood over the floor. The police found blood in the bathroom too, smudges of it on the sink and on the plastic toilet seat lit. Toilet, why, why, toilet seat, <laughs> bad typo. Toilet seat lid, toilet seat lid. But the attacker didn't go anywhere else in the house. The bed was perfect. Everything was in perfect order in the rest of the house. That's it. Uh, supposedly she had an ankle injury at the time and a crutch was strewn across the floor. But as they said, the, the clues didn't add up. So they're having issues with it again. So anyway, Cindy's at the hospital. And she describes the attacker. White male, mid-30s, 5 foot 11 inches to 6 feet. 
average build, medium brown hair, trimmed average length, blue hip jacket. They create a sketch. Ozzy said, Ozzy thought she was keeping something to herself. Yeah, because she's not honest, Ozzy. Um, the door was locked. Before I broke it, it was locked. So it was it was locked from the inside. Um, unless she let somebody in and then they locked it behind her. Um, only two people had a key to the house. One was Agnes and the other one was Pat McBride. So some people thought, oh, maybe Pat came back to kill her. Um, anyway, uh, he be pre briefly became a uh, uh, suspect was ruled out. Ozzy, uh, Pat loved women and loved sex with women, but he was a kind of a chicken shit. So, okay. Ozzy searched the garage and okay, now da, 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 da. let me go through here. And then there's a whole bunch of nonsense. So anyway, right, um, let me go on the next one. Um, at one point, uh, Cindy told Melanie that Roy was her stalker. Now, she didn't describe him as her stalker to the police, but now she's saying to Melanie that he beat her during the marriage and she was terrified of them. She hadn't revealed this earlier because she was afraid he would attack her family. Again, the story about, I'm worried about everybody else, but I'm going to let him basically kill me. And I'm going to keep telling the police over and over again so he keeps getting annoyed. You know, So he keeps getting pissed off at me. If I just shut the hell up and wouldn't call the police, maybe he'd just leave me alone, right? But this, this story about Roy gets, gets crazier and crazier. All right. So he did say once he had slapped her a couple of times during the whole marriage, but he, and he felt bad about that, but he, that was it. That the two times that he kind of went wacko in the face. Um, so anyway, it goes on. Da, 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 da. Uh, let's see about the next attack. Okay. I'm kind of trying, I'm trying to, I'm going to skip through a lot. Oh, here's some, here's some interesting things too. Okay. So, here was another story of something that happened. Let's see. So Ozzy had this pattern. So he was logging her movements. And what, what she would do is she would call into the house exactly when she was leaving the house and call when she arrived. The system worked smoothly at first. Nothing happened. But in mid-June, she went garden. She was gardening and she couldn't find her dog, Heidi. She saw the door was closed that she had left open. Because she's gardening. She's in her yard. So her door is, is closed. It used to be open. But no, but she never saw somebody. She just was gardening and somebody snuck in. She went to a neighbor's house to call Ozzy. She was afraid to go into the house. When we got there, her dog was tied up under a chair with a rope around its neck, uh, bruised and bloody, trembling, sitting in feces, and looked as if he, she, he, the, the dog, it was a female dog, she had been beaten. As soon as she was unbound, she raced out the door into Cindy's arms. A letter on the floor with sexually explicit message with happy birthday. A different kind of cigarette, Rathman cigarette butts on the windowsill where one could look out and see her gardening. Ozzy thought the cord around Heidi's neck was the same as the dead cat ropes. Okay, sometimes it's called a black, it's called same, it's the same black stocking thing. Sometimes it's, it's just a rope. Now, I'll tell you about the cats. So supposedly there were these two dead cats that were strangled by ropes and left either the stories are either hanging from her trees or thrown on her doorstep. Okay. Now, first of all, this guy supposedly sneaks in her house and is smoking cigarettes, hanging around, watching a garden from inside the house. He gets in somehow and does this. Meanwhile, this guy supposedly beats her dog and for some reason puts a rope around its, its neck. Doesn't kill it, but puts a rope around its neck. And it's the same as the dead cat she claimed that were thrown on her lawn. Now, I can't find any proof that these dead cats actually happened. Again, this is where I think there's disingenuousness in these kind of broadcasts. If you're going to say this happened, I want to hear, was it, did, was it reported to the police, A, and B, did, was it proven? Because if you report it right away, the police should come over and find a dead cat on your doorstep or hanging in your tree. That should be listed because that's a huge issue because if someone's going to kill cats and hang them in your tree, it's pretty creepy. So either you got a super creepy stalker or you yourself are pretty creepy because you're killing the neighborhood cats and blaming it on somebody else and hanging them in your own tree. Which one is it? Now, so there's no proof that A, these cats, these strangled cats ever even existed. Because all I know is it's a story she told and I have no proof that this happened. But here's what I don't understand. 
Now, think about this. If the guy was horrible enough to kill cats and hang them in the tree or throw them on the doorstep, what is the question you would ask here about this particular scene? What didn't he do that you would expect him to do if he really wanted to get her and really wanted to scare her? What would he do? It's pretty simple. Somebody tell me, what would she do? I mean, not what she do. <laughs> what would this phantom stalker do? Um, well, that's an interesting point while we're waiting for that question. Answer, if someone, Nicole says, if someone hurt my pets or any animals around, I'd be out of there anyway because it's very creepy. Yeah, she supposedly loved this dog very much, but she, the dog was at home alone when she was at work. You know, so, ah, uh, thank you. Kill the dog. I mean, I'm sorry, but if I were the creepy stalker and I would put those cats in a tree, I'd kill that little, I'd kill that little puppy. I would. I'd hang, I'd put a little rope around that puppy's neck and I'd hang that thing from the chandelier. So when you came back in, ah, my, my dog's hanging from the chandelier. Interesting enough, it wasn't. The dog was not killed. So I find, and Sandra says the same thing, didn't kill the dog, didn't kill the dog. Exactly. Um, and then he, then he says, why didn't he kill her? Oh, that's the question. He's always stalking her and scaring her and almost killing her. Why does he just kill her? Because, I mean, if he's a ma ma massive psychopath or there's a group of psychopaths, why not just offer? You know what I mean? Make life easy. What? For seven years? You're going to stalk somebody? You're not in love with them? What do you, you don't have an obsession like you're a fan, like. <laughs> Is there somebody behind me? Um, where's my cat? That cat will live forever. Nobody's ever going to kill my cat. Um, yeah, you know, it doesn't make sense that somebody would do all this work so long and, and harass her and hurt her, but not enough to kill her and then kill cats, but not her dog. These things do not make sense. This is why the police said something's not something's not right about this case. Again, they, they had the different cigarettes. Now, sure, different cigarettes. That's a very simple, clever way. You buy a separate pack of cigarettes. You take a few out. You smoke them in your house. You leave them there. And that's it. Then you, that looks like somebody else was smoking cigarettes because you don't have that brand. Again, it's a very simple trick. It doesn't prove somebody else did it. Obviously, there was they didn't have DNA fingerprints or anything from anybody else. I don't I think DNA wasn't there yet. So 19, 19. Yeah, it might not have really been there yet. Um, so let's see. Uh Lisa says, I'd like to know if there was any event which took place before all the stalking happened. Not that we know of before she left the the husband and she split up. But again, I don't know. This is what I question, Lisa. Because you don't just suddenly go, if she's if she's not Munchausen, yes, you would have a perfectly normal life until the day it happened. Like, I do not believe on Munchausen's. I haven't shown any signs of having behaviors of Munchausen's. So if at 66 years old, somebody's starting to, st I'm saying people are doing these things to me, maybe there's a credibility to it because I've never made up stories before. I have no manipulative behaviors. I don't think so. And, and But usually a Munchausen person will have all those narcissistic behaviors for years. And maybe they're smaller, but there's something they're doing. Maybe she said before to her husband, I think somebody somebody stole something from me or at work. I think, you know, we got to watch out for this kid because I think he did this and he didn't do it. I don't know because they're not telling us about her previous life. And I just can't believe it was absolutely, um, you know, nothing nothing came of it. Um Nicole says, I would want to get, I won't get myself and the pets out of harm's way. You'd think so. But there's another interesting thing coming up about the dog, the dog walking, which is going to be very interesting. Yeah, it, it did start in the late 1980s. And yeah, uh, I, I, I'm blanking on exactly, but they didn't have use of it that much at the time. Um, what about post-crime behavior? Does that apply to Munchausen? I'm not sure what you mean by that. But, you know, they're going to keep up the story, you know, because they got to get the attention. So that that's the point. Well, hello. Hello, Marco. <laughs> nice to have you here. Um, all right. Let me go on now. All right. So so 
the the host of the show i keep forgetting her name sorry um attacker she, the attacker knew cindy well enough to know heidi loved the dog and that this was personal well then kill the damn dog you know um notes and calls started up again and so then this goes on and on so uh let's see Okay, let me, let me, okay, wait a minute. Where am I here? Oh, okay. This one. Okay, this is the next one that's so interesting. Okay. So apparently on July 23rd, 1984, a couple heard banging on their door and there was a lady there with disheveled hair and leaves in her hair and incoherent. My wife said to call the police. They opened the door and the woman collapsed in my arms. Then she was unconscious. Skin color blotchy, babbling, something around her neck. But it was a nylon wrapped twice around the neck and very tight. I got a knife to, knife to cut it off. Again, not tight enough to kill her. The police showed up and they knew who it was. <laughs> it's, it's Cindy. All right. This is the third time. Yeah, third time. First time was the garage. Second time was the knife in the hand in the house. This is the third time. But this is the first time she had been struck, the attacker had struck in public. Um, she had already changed to two different homes, but this was now in the open. So the first home she got attacked in the garage, second home she got attacked in the kitchen, third home, third time she got attacked in a park. So after, okay, so after they set up the system in the house, around the house, supposedly the stalker didn't come around. Well, you know, she asked Ozzy to set up this, they talked, I guess, and he said, well, set up a system. Well, if they set up a system, then she can't do things either because she needs to have the system pick up somebody coming and going from the house. And so, well, you can't have the stalker come to the house now, can you? So anyway, so now she, this person attacked her and left her for dead in a park, Dunbar, Dunbar Park, and out of the range of the surveillance system. How useful. So now Cindy was falling apart. All right. So how did this happen? All right. Let's see what this story is. Um, because this, again, is, is a weird one. All right. Wait, 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 hold on a second. My page is acting stupid. Okay. All right. So she was attacked in the park. Now, you might ask what she was doing in the park. She went to the park. She, she, had, that, she had that security thing where she called Ozzy and told when she was coming and going. She called to say, this is useful, to always tell Ozzy where you're going to be so that they'll find you soon enough before you croak, right? Cindy radioed security to say she was driving over to Dunbar Park at 8.30 p.m. to walk her dog and would be back by 9.30. The sun sets at 9 p.m. What's the other thing you wouldn't be doing if you had a stalker? What would you not be doing? Somebody do tell me. <laughs> what would you not be doing? And while I wait for that answer, uh, anyway... She thought it was safe enough. Okay. Um, taking her walk in a busy park in daylight. Except that. Well, well, I wouldn't walk my dog in the park, but that's not the problem. There you go. Not out in the dark. No, actually, that's it. Not walk, walking in the dark alone. Be out after dark. Yes. You got a guy. You're going to be stalked. You're taking a little puppy and you're going to walk. She went before it got dark, but interestingly enough, she made sure she stayed after it got dark. So uh, this is just, this is so suspicious. If you were being really stalked, you would be terrified to be out in the dark and you wouldn't do it. So anyway, she was attacked in the park and the person was long gone. So she, the house that she went to was across the street from the park. Um, the intake doctor noticed she was weepy and highly distressed and she had taken, her behavior was consistent with having taken a significant dose of drugs. A needle mark in her right arm uh, was there too. Uh, she took some sedatives, there were sedatives in large quantities. Um, oral or injected, injected wasn't noticed. She had a prescription for Ativan, uh, but she was incoherent when she arrived. So it was not a normal dose, but somehow they didn't do a very good check on this. Anyway, the attack in Dunbar, park found sticks and leaves in her underwear somebody said there are sticks and leaves up her butt too and something you know, so in another case she said she had a knife that they stabbed her in the vagina but i don't know if that's true but there was no medical sign of assault again somebody's grabbing you in a park you think there would be a sign of assault and fighting of course i think she's trying to use this i was i was uh, you know hypodermic you know you need a, and then i went you know i couldn't fight 
So also she was attacked in public. However, since it was dark, there was no witness to this attack. Um, only after she went to the house was she discovered. Now, um, this is what she said happened. They found her dog wandering around. When she regained consciousness, they asked her what happened. She said she had driven to Dunbar Park to walk her dog around 8.30. She spent about an hour there and then started walking back to her car. All right. After a start. For someone in terror being stalked and killed, it's odd behavior. Yes. Okay. That's what I said. Not the show. Um, a van pulled up. The driver asked for directions to Churchill Street. Cindy said he had a beard and a blonde woman was in the passenger seat. And that was her last memory before waking up in the hospital. Later on, she claimed that she was pulled into the back of the van and there was an ex another guy in the back of the van. So there were three people. So her story changed. So now we don't just have a stalker. We have a gang that's after her. Um, again, the police thought and Ozzy thought she was not sharing everything she knew. Ozzy, she's a liar. Um, all right. So anyway, again, trying to cover so they wouldn't hurt her family. All right. You know, and again, if I was so worried about them hurting my family, I'd get the, so far away from my family so my family wouldn't be hurt. But I don't think she was that worried about her family. All right. Uh, I, they go over to the park at 2 a.m. and they find drag marks in the, the dirt across the street from the neighbors. Her shoes were still there. And the pepper spray she had give, he, Ozzie had given her for self-defense. They, they found her car in the lot. And, oh, yeah, here's the DNA testing. It was 1984, and DNA testing was still four years away in Canada. But uh, they... What was that? Um, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. That I'm just, I'm going to try to move forward here. Let's see. Oh, when she, they did hypnosis on her. And when they did the hypnosis, then she remembered this. Walking her dog, walking back to the car, hearing laughter, and a man with no face removed a wig. Metallic van. And then she said a couple strangled and kidnapped her on the floor of the van. And the floor of the van was carpeted. The third person with a mask stuck a needle in her arm and someone said, Hamugash, a Zulu word meaning be warned, do as I say. If you speak Zulu, it really means safe travels and farewell, take care. But she felt her husband was in the van because when, when she was attacked because her husband was from South Africa and might know Zulu. <laughs> oh my God. Um, now Ozzy, good old Ozzy, I... It may have been a good bodyguard, but I wouldn't have hired him for anything else. Um, but this sounds like a nutter to me. Ozzy shared more details that Cindy had in said in confidence. Oh, he told her, look, she told him something special. That she was frightened, that her marriage was difficult and her husband was controlling, doing this to control her. So now she's blaming it on Roy. She's trying to say he, he did that. Um, now, Ozzy says that Roy was dealing drugs, hundreds of drugs. He had all these samples and was selling drugs and had two guys selling drugs, also dealing with people in Africa that were strange people. Uh, and that's what Cindy supposedly had discovered. This gets even stupider. This is, I say the stupidity on this case. It's like, <laughs> I'll read this to you. All right. Supposedly, Cindy discovered his drug dealing. And that was one reason she left him. Not, not, the, not the girlfriend now. Now it's drug dealing. Supposedly, Okay. She flushed his drugs down the toilet. Uh, but Roy thought she had taken the drugs and that's what started him coming after her. He felt she still had the drugs and he wanted his drugs back. The drug operation started in South Africa and drugs were brought by the way of the Gulf Islands where he went sailing and brought into Canada. There was no verification of this, of course. Ozzy said she didn't know if it was a full drug operation. Ozzy, get this one. Ozzy said that Roy asked if he could use her garage to store stuff and he put all his drugs in her garage. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> okay, somebody tell me what's wrong with this story? That Roy wanted to use her garage to put his drugs in. What's wrong with that story? Somebody come up with that one. Mm hmm. Uh, but, <laughs> well, yes, she has gone off the deep end, but yeah, I'm going to get to the, I'm going to get to the mental hospital in a bit. Yes. She did go to mental hospital. What was the problem with, with the issue of Roy 
that Cindy Sangroy is storing drugs in her in her garage. What did she? What other story was just said? What did Cindy do? Drugs are illegal. Well, that's not it, Corrine. What did Cindy do prior to Roy supposedly asking to use her her, her garage to store his drugs in? What's the problem with that? <laughs> well, yeah, he did own the garage. Why would he want? He did own a house, but that's not it. What did what did Cindy do to him with the with when she found out he had drugs in the house? What did she do? I'm not getting an answer, so I'm going to go with it. She flushed his drugs down the toilet. Let me ask you a question. If your if your woman or your ex-woman flushed all your drugs down the toilet, are you going to then put more drugs in her possession, in her garage, so she can destroy all those drugs too? Think about that. <laughs> Is not, are you that much of an idiot, Roy, that you're like, oh man, she flushed my drugs, so let me give her some more to take care of. Yeah, makes it makes no sense. It's stupid. Okay, so that's that's the theory. So anyway, now it gets worse. Now what he's doing is Roy didn't actually try to hurt her, but because she flushed his drugs and supposedly destroyed his drug ring, he went after her. Only Roy didn't do it himself, but he asked his smugglers to take care of him, to take care of her. So Roy hired two men to harass Cindy and then paid them to kill her. You know, first of all, why does he even need to harass her? I mean, if you got bad guy, that you know, just kill her. I mean, you know, you don't waste all your time with all this. You really think two smugglers are going to spend all their time writing up notes and going and hanging cats and trees? You think they're going to do all this shit for you? No, they're going to go, dude. Uh, we'll just take her out back and shoot her. You know, <laughs> this is this is like too much work. It's wasting our time. This is again a very stupid story. I don't know where the story come came from, but I'm going to say Cindy put it in Ozzy's head. All right. So then, continues. The longer it does say this during the uh, the the uh, the um, podcast, the longer Ozzy speaks, the harder he is to follow. Yeah, because he's full of shit. Um, Roy also oversaw the attacks, like when Roy was watching from the garage. So when she was being attacked, Roy's sitting there with a cup of coffee, going, "Good job, guys." Um, so the, the detectives began to think the PI was unreliable. Yeah, I think. <laughs> All right. But one new detective decided he'd look into his theories, asked Interpol to look into it. And then they interviewed Roy's first wife and returned to South Africa, who had returned to South Africa. Then he put a surveillance van outside Cindy's home. Nothing. So again, when, when they say the police didn't do the job, they contacted Interpol to see if Roy was running a big, huge drug ring from South Africa. They did their work. They came up with nothing, nothing. Okay. So now then the police did this. They asked her to call Roy and ask him on the telephone why he was doing this crap to her. And this, this is what, this was what happened on that phone call. Are you denying it? My God, I am certainly denying it. I've always denied it. I have absolutely nothing whatever to do with it. So she tried to trap him. The police said, okay, we'll trap him on, you know, we're going to record it. And they came up with nothing. It is not, he didn't fall for anything there. Uh, let me mention a couple other, the other, other things that happened in her house. There are fires in her house like this. Um, and there was this fire. Let's see, which one is this? Uh, okay, wait a minute. This is the, this is a fire. Uh, one of the fires started in, I think it was her bathroom. And what happened was when the police came and this is a female detective, she came and she's like, look, the, the, the the, the windows aren't even open more than six inches. And I don't know if they don't open more, but there were, there was snow outside. There were no footprints going up from the sidewalk to the house. There were no footprints. And even if you threw in some incendiary things into the tub, there wouldn't have been a big fire or, and so it was very clear that she had set this, she had set the fires herself. And, and I'll get, to, I do have a comment in one of the later uh, episodes on that. So let me go, go for it. Okay. So let's see. Uh, okay, when does she go to the oh, last second? Oh, okay. So now she goes to a hypnotist. The, the police want to go to a hypnotist and find out what the heck's wrong with this woman. Uh, because she's got more threatening letters. This is 1984. Um, and phone lines are cut again. 
And one time, oh, by the way, one time when the phone lines were cut, what happened was Pat and the other detective had gone out. They had been having coffee with Cindy. And then they went out for a while and came back. And the phone line, they had made a phone call prior to leaving. Uh, and and when they came back, the phone phone was dead. And and Pat looked in his, uh, he had a little, you know, bag of uh, tools and stuff. And he had this, this cutter thing. And there was like stuff on the, you know, what they call the business end of the pliers or whatever you call the cutting things. And they matched the phone wires. And they were inside his house in his bag. So who do you think borrowed them to cut the phone wires? Okay, let me go on. Um, so she goes to this uh, psychiatrist. This is the story she tells. Uh, she said it was overcast and raining and we rode from the club. They, they, they're boating. We didn't take any pets. Uh, we used the motor. The boat was loaded. This is, this is July 20th, 1981 when they were still married, when Roy and Cindy were still married. It was a nice relaxed Tuesday. We had a barbecue, but I felt a little nauseous. Anyway, they get to this little island. And I thought Roy, she was on the boat. She supposedly didn't feel well. She, she was sleeping on the boat and Roy went off the boat. And then she thought she heard Roy calling her. So I jumped off and walked onto the porch and I knocked, feeling silly. I opened the door. Well, because it's, Maybe because it's a place you don't know and you shouldn't be walking in somebody else's house, but okay. And then she says, I must not talk about it. And she had this look of sheer terror on her face. There were, she says, there were two people on the floor. Roy is there, shot, frozen, blood all over, blood on a big knife he has. It's five or six inches long. The woman is on the left, brown skirt, white blouse and bare feet, blood under her, a man with blue shorts, dark shorts, nothing on top. Uh, he was about 33, the girl was about 20. He rubbed blood. And it, so Roy now leans down, takes blood and fluid off their bodies and rubs her face with it and says, if I told anyone, he would do the same to my mothers and sisters. <laughs> wow. OK. Then she said she ran out, threw up over the sail, the, the, the uh, porch railing, and then they got on the boat and apparently Roy chopped up the bodies, put them in bags and they threw them overboard. And he told her no one would ever believe her. The amusing thing about this is later, the sister actually says she that Cindy told Melanie this story way, way long ago, way without hypnosis. This was a story she had she had told Melanie. So, <laughs> and it was a different version of the story, by the way, but it was a somewhat similar story. So now we have Roy as a murderer, as a drug dealing murderer, chopping up people in a cabin, and threatening her with that. Again, she just hangs around in town and doesn't go to Indonesia and hang out with her brother. So anyway, they look for the cabin and they never could find the cabin. Oh, what a surprise. So anyway, things go on. And now she is having, uh, let's see, when, 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 does, when, when does this happen? Hold on a second. Mm -mm -mm. It, it, it's so, it's, there's so much here. I mean, there's a hundred issues. So I'm trying to find, now I'm going to try to move further and see when she went to the psychiatric hospital. Um, but she did go there, but let's see. Oh, yes. So anyway, she got really depressed. Her, her, her brother took her to the hospital. They recommended ongoing treatment, but she changed her mind. And um, the brother got her out six days later. They tried to keep her in there, but the brother brother promised the hospital she would get 24-hour care, but then she just went straight home and didn't get any care. That's the first time she went to the mental hospital. And now we go on, and there's another, another horrible, let's say this. Okay, so we have two more incidents here. Um, one is that in December 1985, she moved to Richmond to a duplex. They got a call about an attack. It was winter and she was probably lucky to be found or she might have died. She had bruises and scratches on her hands and back and a black stocking tied around her neck. Three students found her in a ditch near the, near the campus. So that was the next one. Um, they found more drugs in her system again and another puncture in her arm. So basically she's trying to say that people come and jump her and stab her with a hypodermic, knock her out, and then you know, put this thing around her neck and leave her in a ditch this time. So, um, so that's the next one. And then I want to see when she got, okay. When did she go to the hospital? Uh, hold on a second. She was getting frustrated now because the, it seemed like, um, she wasn't, 
she wasn't getting enough help. When did she go to the, I'm trying to find out when she went to the, uh, the, the mental hospital. Um, okay. Hold on a second. I'm trying to find when she went there. Um, there was another, there was another case too. Um, it's, it's so many of them. It's crazy. Um, where was the, can you please be patient. I found that one. I'm trying to find out where the, where the, so we got, we got the, we got the, uh, the garage, we got the kit, garage attack, the kitchen attack. Now we got the ditch attack and there's a final attack where she's attacked in her garage. Um, and I'm trying to just see where that one is. Uh, okay. Meanwhile, she went to the mental, uh, she did, went, she went to the mental hospital. She did. Um, they finally said, you know, this girl, this girl, this girl needs help. And so they sent her to the mental hospital and this, this plays into some really crazy stuff later on. Um, where's my, where's my hospital? Not, not, not that. How about this? Yeah. Okay. So she went to the hospital. She actually went to one of these really mental institution places that are kind of creepy. And she did say, uh, I still feel suicide is my best option. And when I get out, that's what I'm going to do. So she did threaten su suicidal. She had suicidal ideation. She said she was going to commit suicide because she says because the attacks wouldn't stop, but also because people weren't believing her. That's why she got so upset and ended up in the hospital. Be and so the question is, was it because of the attacks that made her go over the edge and need psychiatric help? Or was it because she couldn't get enough attention no matter what she did didn't really work so she went to the hospital she got lots of lots of um drugs and stuff and um got lots of psychotherapy and th this will come into play later um basically they tried their best they came up with ideas about what was wrong with her um you know different different diagnoses uh like the borderline personality disorder and such they tr they did a lot of uh you know therapy with her trying to get her to come you know forth with what happened in her life and she spent a lot of time in there, but then she finally got out and then she moved into another home and let's see. Okay. Let me see what the new home is. Um, so she was having all this progress uh, theoretically. So she's living on her own again, fighting for her career because she, she lost your job for a while. Uh, well, they, they finally said, you know, you've been, you've been a mental, mental institution. You can't come back in the high level position you were at. So she was living on her own again, fighting for her career. She got her divorce. And she changed her name to James. And that's also some weird thing somebody comes up with later. But anyway, this, this um, psychiatrist, Friesen, was treating Cindy. Um, and so then things seemed to be getting better in 1986, in the summer. She sold her house. Over the next two years, she sold her house, painted her car, looked for a new job, and made new friends. She was Cindy James now. So she attempted to get her life back, but things went wrong again. She got a new guy named Tom. It looked like a sign of progress. Tom was a lot older than her. Again, 20 some years older. Um, but she said she was having difficulties getting close to Tom. Um, and she sometimes felt that she was like, you know, couldn't really go into a relationship because she didn't trust people and all of that. She had so much hatred. And she didn't, you know, thought people would cheat on her, blah, blah, blah. Oh, mind, oh, mind you. Here's another interesting thing. I want to point this out before I go on to what happened to Tom and then the final the final thing here. Here's my question. She had a diary. She kept a diary of all these events. The question is, then they read these diaries and it sounds like all these attacks are happening. She's giving her, you know, she's talking from the, from her heart about all the feelings she has about these attacks and all the struggles she's going through. The question is, should you believe a diary? And a lot of people do. Many people think because it's something theoretically private, that everything you write in that diary is going to be truthful. And that is not true. Some psychopathic people, some people with severe narcissism will write what they want people to believe in that diary. Either sometimes they write it so they can create their story for themselves. See, I can, I, I was attacked. So I'm going to write a story about how I was attacked and how I feel about being attacked. That's their way of creating a new reality. And also, you know, it's amazing how these diaries are sometimes shown to the psychiatrist get into other people's hands so that then they can say, oh, see, she wrote this in the diary. <laughs> um, uh, so you can't believe a diary because she, she has a lot of things in there, but doesn't mean they're true. That's just a point. Uh, there, there we go. Thank you very much. 
how to stay at a psychiatric hospital for 10 weeks. Yeah, that, I, there's a lot of information here and I'm not going to go through it all. But yeah, it did escalate for a while because she had, there had already been that garage attack, the, the kitchen attack, the, the ditch attack. And then she kind of lost her mind at that and said, hey, you know, and so she ended up in the, in the mental hospital at that point uh, because things were escalating and she was, but they weren't believing her. That's the whole point. The police still did not believe her. And that kind of, I think, sent her over the edge. She was really upset about that. Um, wouldn't they have diagnosed her as neurotic? Well, I might have thrown that one in as well. Um, yes, this is very true. Compulsive liars also lie, lie in diaries. So you can't necessarily believe a diary, just to keep that in mind. Um, <laughs> diaries are often BS or fantasies. Yeah, it's just, um, no, she staged everything, including her diary. I think, Molly, that is correct. I, I believe that she had her whole thing going. And if this is her, it's like serial killers. Serial killers, people say, well, why do they do these things? Well, because that's their entire life and fantasy. This is where they get their power. So somebody may spend a lot of time fishing or maybe spend time doing artwork. But if those aren't your thing, you might just spend your time creating these attacks, creating diaries, creating whatever you're creating, because that's your whole thing that you want people to. That's how you get your attention. You don't you know, you think she's a pretty lady uh, and men should like her and she's got a good job. That should be sufficient. But that doesn't mean it's enough for some people. It's just not. And so, you know, you can't go by that. So yes, you can spend a lot of time. That's your new hobby. You can, you can spend a lot of time in the hobby. Uh, how would Ellie handle the situation today? Probably the same. You know, the, the claim is, oh, see, they didn't know what they were doing back then. They worked their butts off back then trying to, they were trying to help the woman. Then they were trying to prove, get the evidence. They were trying to prove it was somebody else and they didn't have any success with it. They, they, they wiretapped, they, they did surveillance. They did everything. I mean, they did hypnosis. I mean, the family that says they didn't do enough and the, this podcast that says they didn't do enough, shame on them. Those police worked their butts off. I forgot how hundreds of thousands of dollars they spent on this woman and wasted you know, all of that. And they're not, people want the police to be psychologists. They're, it's not their job to save this woman from her own, uh, their, her own psychological issues. That's for her family, friends, whatever else, herself. It's not the police's job. They're there to protect the community from violence and, and crime. They're not there to be, you know, they, they tried. They actually did stuff that tried to get her, that got her into to a therapy. So they, do, they went way beyond what they had to go. I'm just mad that they think that, no, they, they, they put, them, put them down like that. I think it's terrible. Um, uh, well, this is a good point. She's her own worst enemy. She lies and doesn't get the help she needs. Do you know why? Because she doesn't want the help. Because if, if she got the help, she'd be a normal person again. She doesn't want to be normal. She wants the attention. Psycho, uh, she's psychopathic or narcissistic or whatever you want to call her, borderline personality. Which, by the way, borderline personality people, the problem is that they're the glass half empty and you can never fill it. It's like a big hole. And no matter what you put in a hole, it's never enough. They need more. They need more. They need more. And it's a, it's a level of narcissism that just can't, can't be satisfied. So, um, yeah, and that may be true. A normal life was just too boring. Some people, that is actually sometimes true. Okay, let's go on. So let, let me go to the fourth attack, and then we'll go to the fifth attack, and then we're going to go to the inquest. Okay, the fourth attack was, this was one where she was in her, Oh, so what happened to Tom? Okay, let's go to the next one. What happened to Tom? So Tom was a friend. He was a real estate agent. Um, and she, she, had a, she had him around and seemed like they were, you know, um, getting sort of getting, you know, you know, being friends and getting closer. And She probably had sex with him, I'm going to say. But anyway, um, then she moved into her new home. And she had, the, she had these people all around her trying to like be her bodyguards. They told her to cut her hedges down so they could see and all that stuff. Um, and then she had more troubles again. Um, and then, let's see, what happened to, oh, this is the next one. She's found in her carport and she's been supposedly sexually assaulted. And th this one, um, where's the carport? Okay, wait a minute. Carport, shut it. Yeah. 
Oh, here's the carport. Okay. So this is her house. She's attacked supposedly in the carport and her legs are hanging out of the car. She's nude from the waist down. Hands are tied. Feet are tied again. These kind of the same thing. Black thing around her neck. And then she says, I remember thinking, oh my God. And then I can't remember anything else. So um, she was still breathing, of course. Uh, they had the hypodermic thing again. They rush into the hospital and um, there, there was a Again, cigarette butts that weren't hers. And, you know, I, you know, I'm not sure why people, I guess he's supposed to be waiting in the garage of smoke and waiting for her to show up, I guess. Uh, there's a douche bottle and a bloody piece of Kleenex on the ground. Looked like a sexual assault. But then when they checked her out, there was no sign of sexual assault. So it just looked like it, but it wasn't. Um, now, here's something really weird. The police officer wanted a sexual assault exam. The doctors refused saying she'd been through enough. Who does that? I mean, what? I don't know. Maybe they did do that back in the day. But oh, my God, you know, if you if you come in and you claim somebody's assaulted you, you have to go through a sexual assault exam. He insisted. But they found. Now, here's interesting. Uh, they found scratches on her perineum and two gray pu pubic hairs that did not match her own. But there were no signs of sexual assault. OK, so who is she dating that's older and has gray hair? Maybe Tom. <laughs> I don't also they're not hers uh, um, you know she's getting older she could have those little little extra ones just floating around they, they look different than your normal pubic hairs because they're, they're just wiry like you know people get wiry hair on their head and wiry more wiry beards with gray comes in different than regular regular hair could be her own but they didn't recognize it or it could be Tom's because she was around Tom um, but there was no sexual assault again so why would they stage a, if you were, if you were the stalker, why would you stage a sexual assault instead of just heck, just go ahead and go ahead and rape the woman. You know what I mean? I mean, you're already a criminal and you're strangling her. You might as well have some fun, but no, they just stage a sexual assault. Again, something that never, ever happened. So it's just, that's just so bizarre. Anyway, after that, they still didn't believe it. So then Tom spent more time with her and then he, so one night she said uh, he wanted a relationship with her, a bigger relationship. She told him no. I don't know what that, uh, he wanted to be a permanent boyfriend. She said no. And then she waved goodbye to him and he was found dead in her car, in his car in the drive. And he was 65 years old and he had a heart attack. So I guess she didn't kill him. He just had a heart attack. <clears throat> so anyway, she lost the only man she had trusted in seven years. Now he's gone. And that month, the notes and threatening calls started up again. Ah, oh, they scratched you're dead in the ice on the back of her car. Um, she told her ex-husband again. Oh, she talked, told me about her ex-husband and she was very scared of him. Said he pushed her down a flight of stairs. That's a new one. Um, so now she told that she was working at a hospital now because she couldn't get her old job back. So they were walking her to her car. Uh, but you know, there were messages still stuck in her car. Uh, the detective tried to put a camera next to her house to see if anybody was coming around it. And, and there was this incident where somebody unscrewed the light bulb and broke a window. And he was like, oh, cool, I got it. But the problem was during the time he had put the camera in and the actual incident, the, the stupid plant had grown over the camera and blocked it. <laughs> that was really bad luck. Oh, my God. So anyway, let's see. So then some time goes by. Okay, now, now it's time for the last scene where she, she disappears. Now, here's what happened. Tammy came over to the payroll department at her hospital, dressed very nicely, like she just had a makeover, all right? Because she had gone to the mall. She got her nails done. She got a makeover. And now she was coming to the payroll department to get her check early. And they said she had to come back. And she couldn't get it early. So anyway, apparently she did get the check. There's, a, there's saying that she went to the bank and that's where her car was found. Um, the bank card was found under the car with a slip of paper. There were groceries in the car or purses in the car. I mean, but the bank thing is weird because I heard two different stories on that. So don't know. So it's a local mall. So anyway, she, they also supposedly she had asked Agnes to come over with her husband that night and play bridge. Her dog was at home. She set up the bridge table and put the cards on it. Agnes comes over to play bridge and knocks. And nobody answers. The dog's there. And they were going to go home and call the police. But on the way home, they saw her car in the parking lot of a shopping center, which I think is interesting right there. So if they, if, if Cindy knows the route, 
that Agnes would take to go back home and would see her car. Maybe she wanted Agnes to see her car. Okay. Some people say, well, if she got a makeover and she got her nails done and she was going to play bridge that night. Oh, and she asked somebody what gift to buy a, a, a friend, the son who was eight years old, a little boy. And she went to the store and she bought him a croquet set and some wrapping paper. So this looks like a person who's not planning to die, right? All these things add up to, I'm happy. I have plans. Even tonight I have plans. And yet she disappears, right? Or the other possibility is that that's exactly what she wants you to think. She did all these things because she wants people to think she didn't commit suicide or she's not going to pretend to commit suicide. She's going to have another attack and she wants to everybody to be sure that they recognize, hey, I wouldn't have done that. Look, look at what I did that day. You know, look at all the things I did that day. And clearly I was not planning to die or even pretend to die. So you have the two ways of looking at it. Anyway, she goes to this place. This is where a car is found. And then what happens is when Agnes sees this, she calls the police station. She goes to the police station. Officers come with her to the car. There's a dribble of blood on the door handle. The door is locked. Um, they go over to the shopping. Okay, let's see. Uh, it's about mid. No, okay, let's see. Hold on a second. About a foot and a half under the car was her bank card and a slip of paper, which was weird because if they had a fight, you would think that thing would just drop on the ground. Maybe somebody kicked it under, but did they or did it, was it thrown under? That's a good question. Uh, although there was no sign of a fight there. And also, it's broad daylight when this happens. So I think it was I think it was daylight. What time did she disappear? Uh, I'm trying to figure out what time she disappeared. But it's in a it's in a it's in a it's in a very, very open location. It's really not a great place to have a big struggle go on and have try to kidnap somebody. So it seems like an odd place. Seems easier to look around and see if anybody's looking and just walk away. So that's my theory on that. But all right, the car was impounded. Uh, then the police looked for in the bushes and the bins. A police dog found nothing. They knocked on doors. They dispatched a helicopter, talked to bus drivers, they checked the airports. Police are doing their work. Okay, so now... Um, so what time did this happen? Uh, somewhere around 4.30, they said that she was going to go to the bank. Okay, so it, was, it wasn't that late. Okay, um, they, they they got the groceries, she had groceries in the back of the car, and they took those groceries back to the store and had them add up how much those cost to see if they matched the receipt, but they did not match a receipt. And they wondered whether she had bought some black nylon stockings that added to the, the, the receipt, but they that were no longer there. All right. So anyway, let's see. Um, so after, oh, this is interesting in the show. So anyway, she's disappeared. Um, and after they find her body, by the way, they went to see Roy, right? And they said that this is what the show says. I opened the door and saw a blanket hanging there and a TV tray and weapons by his bed. So he, he had time to react to defend himself. Booby traps. He seemed paranoid and unhinged. Roy insisted he wasn't involved in her terror, and now he said someone was out to get him. So now he's paranoid. Anyway, this is what they say in the show. Then he added stuff about a stalker. He heard two men last October trying to break into his apartment. Then he received a menacing message on his answering machine. He played them for An Anderson. Cindy, dead, meet, soon. This was two weeks before she was brutally attacked in her garage, but he held on to it for eight months. He didn't tell them where to find, but it didn't tell them where to find Cindy. Wait a minute. They're saying he held on to this message for eight months, according to actual other information. No, when he got these me this message, he immediately told the police it, that he had gotten this message. It, he didn't withhold it for eight months. I see no evidence of that. And the exact opposite is supposedly true. Now listen to the message. This is an interesting man. I'm going to put it up to the thing here. Let's see. Let me be sure I have it on high. Here's the message. Ready? Here it goes. <laughs> I hope you heard that. Okay. Most people think it sounded like a woman. So, uh, 
So, so he got this. <sighs> yeah, Marco says that's a lady. Now, I, I can't absolutely be sure that 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 there wasn't some you know, alteration done to that particular video, but that's supposedly the video. I can't vouch for that. But other people heard that way back when said it was a lady. Um, so, so he got that, but he didn't withhold it. And somehow in the show, they said he he was withholding it. Um, so, the, oh, but here it is. Here's from another website. This is what it said. Police thoroughly investigated the doctor, Dr. Roy, her ex-husband, and found no evidence he was in any way involved. In the midst of police investigating the doctor, he presented them with a recording left on his very answering machine, targeting his wife. It was the first time ever he'd received such a call. Here's a recording. And then they have it. Police analyzed the voice and determined it was a woman's voice and most likely Cindy herself. Uh, two weeks after they confronted her about the recording, they were called to Cindy's house and she was found naked from the waist down in a driver's seat with a black stocking around her neck. They, so, so in the show, when you hear the podcast, it sounds like the ex-husband was withholding this information from the police that a guy, somebody had called him before she, two weeks before she was attacked, somebody had called him, not Cindy, mind you, but somebody, and he had kept it from the police and there, therefore he was trying, he was involved somehow. But in reality, the police actually confronted Cindy with this because Roy told them about it. They confronted her and two weeks later, she got attacked. So see, there's a lot of deception in the show, in my opinion. So, um, so let's find out about, okay, so here's her body. Now, let me go to the spot where she is in the, um, now she's, now this is where they find her. And th th this is a very weird, hold on a second. Okay. She's found uh, supposedly a mile and a half from where the car is parked next to this house right here. And this is, this is old Ozzy. And he's right, it's right next to the street. So she's not like, she's right there. Um, not in, not in sight, like, you know, right here. She's a little bit into the bushes. Uh, and then this is, this is her body found there on the ground. Um, now the question always is why would she walk a mile and a half from her car? And why would she go here and not be uh, even more public place, especially since she was all dressed up nice and looking pretty. Um, that's a good question. And the, there's two possibilities. I think that supposedly there were people hanging around in this house and there was some other guy hanging around. So there are people walking up and down this area. Um, it's possible that at some point she decided this is far enough. I'm, I, I can't, I'm going to walk away from my car. So it doesn't look like I'm, it looks like I was kidnapped. Um, and then I've, I've gone far enough. I'll just lay down here. Surely somebody will walk come along this area because whatever she, and I don't know when she took the, the, supposedly she ingested all this medicine into her system. Uh, there was a mark on her. So there was a question whether she had uh, injected morphine, a huge amount of it, or whether she took it by pills. The police believe she took everything by pills. There was no hy hypodermic needle here. There were, there was no container, but I'm sorry, if you got pills, all you do, do, do is put them in your pocket. <laughs> you know, you don't really need a container. You can put them in the pocket. Um, did she take them in the car and then walk a mile and a half? Or did she take some in the car and save some for later? Did she take none of them in the car and just get her all set, set up there? I mean, it is a very, very peculiar crime. So in theory, it looks, it can look more like she was abducted, except that really, I mean, now the somebody, so this is what it would be like. If if she was truly abducted and 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 killed over here, that would mean either she was not lying about all the other attacks. All the other attacks are real. This brilliant guy who had, for reasons completely unknown, um, well, they were Roy wanted her not, never to talk about the people he was chopping up in a cabin. This person committed all of these other crimes, chased her everywhere, and then finally decides to kill her that day even though nobody believes her, why would they even bother? And she still hasn't, she still hasn't given up the name of the guy. So, I mean, for seven years, she's been pretty darn silent. Why do they feel a need to do this? So that makes no sense. Okay. So let's assume that maybe, maybe it's Roy. Roy's like, I'm so tired of being accused of this crap and you've been staging this stuff for seven years. I'm going to get you and stage it just like you would have done it. And I'll get away with it. And then you'll die. And I can get this 
this this ends that all this crap ends theoretically could that be possible it could be but again there's really no there was again no evidence of anybody else involved except for the fact that it's an odd crime and what ozzy says is well where's where's the evidence that you know that she would have walked here where's the evidence that she you know could have taken these drugs where would she have gotten the drugs which by the way the family found a massive amount of drugs in her house uh when they went and cleaned out her house later on and they took all the drugs and did not they supposedly wrote down things and reported the wrote down things to the police but they took a lot of drugs behind the police's back and never told them about them so that's questionable right there um but, you know, uh, could she have done it? Absolutely. There was no question that she could have tied herself up that way, that she could have taken the drugs. It was the same kind of crime as she's always committed. It, because she did. So we have to have two possibilities. One is she just, she got, it was having a happy day. And finally that guy, her ex-husband just got sick of her and said, I'm going to finally get her. Or she staged all of that again to say, you're never going to think that I killed myself, you know, and, because she she was saying she wanted to commit suicide so maybe this was the final one i'm going to go someplace i'm really truly going to die this time around and they're going to find my body and i'm she may not have thought of decomposition decomposition um she may have thought she would be found within 24 hours and she'd be all made up and have pretty nails my, mind you again no marks on her body no sign of assault her nails weren't messed up so she did not look like she had been abducted and murdered and you would think by this time She'd be very aware of somebody pulling up and grabbing her. You, let's say they even had a hypodermic needle. You're walking to your car. You would think you have some idea that something, somebody, car is pulling up. People are jumping out. You would be fighting in the parking lot. You would have a broken nail. You'd have scratches on. You'd have something. She had nothing. So could she have walked a mile and a half? Of course she could. And then decided this is it. Maybe she was doing a lot of drugs by that point. Maybe she just got there, put on her little ties and took all the drugs. I don't know. All I can say is it looks just like all the other crimes and the other crimes all point back to her. I personally think it is, I think it is a suicide. I don't even think it's an accident. Some thought maybe she, you know, staged this again. And this time she just picked a bad place. And this time she just died. It could be that, but because of the last day, she did all these things the last day, the hair and the makeup. I think she was going to kill herself. And I think her message was this. You never believed me. And now I'm going to do it in such a way that you're going to have to believe me. You're going to believe I was murdered. I'm going to get my, you know, people do things, even though they're not going to be around to see the results. They do those kind of things just so they can have their last ha ha because they know what people are going to think. She also may have been wanting to point the finger at her ex-husband again. Ha ha, Roy, I'm finally going to get you. They're going to think you did this. And by the way, for a number of those crimes, which he claimed Roy did, he wasn't even in the country. So he would literally have to hire somebody. So, you know, I'm sure she wanted that last chance to get back at Roy and thought maybe this will do it. And it's in her head. So it doesn't have to always make total sense to the rest of us. It just has to make sense to her. So that I think is really interesting. And then I'm going to go to the, the inquest. Um, so let me let me look at a couple of your comments here. She's the one that brought suicide into the conversation. She did. She said she she that that's where she wanted to go. She was going to eventually she was going to commit suicide when she got out. So yes. Now this this is what I think. Whoops. Wait a minute. Hold on. Um, she's the one. Oh, wait a minute. Steve says she thought he would have the last. She would have the last laugh. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is um. This is a really serious situation. When you get a lot of the Munhausen people, they go on for years like this. They will claim crazier and crazier things. They will do crazier and crazier things. And sometimes finally they get to the point where they're like, I'm going to prove you all wrong. You know, so cause of death, um, overdose of drugs, overdose of drugs. Not the, not the thing around her neck again, overdose of, of uh, drugs. Humanimal says she wanted to look pretty. I do think so. I think she wanted to look pretty. And she would probably suicide. You know, it's one of these things that um, uh, I can't, uh, the drug levels, uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, she had morphine and fluorazepam. I forgot how to pronounce it. Fluorazepam? I think fluorazepam. I'm trying to see. 
Okay. Um, by the way, when the family went in there to her house, they found glass cutter, needles, syringes, IV equipment, a saline solution, vials of prescription drugs dating back to 1983, more than 900 pills. They found sedatives, antidepressants, and antipsychotics. Um, now, let's see. Uh, they didn't suspect foul play. They, they made a conclusion, uh, a 23-page memo. Uh, they said, uh, so now, Ozzy thought that her body was dumped, um, that, that he, they killed her elsewhere, and then just, she wasn't even there for two weeks. They kept her body someplace, and then they just came out and dumped it. Because he says, which I thought was funny, that if her body had been there right, what, right away, somebody would have found it. Well, maybe that's what Cindy thought too. If Ozzy thinks that, maybe Cindy thought that they're going to find me. Maybe she, maybe she wasn't going to kill herself, but she wanted to be found. Maybe she did, or maybe she wanted her body to be found before she decomposed, so she looked all pretty in death. You know, if Ozzy thinks somebody should have found her, then Cindy could well have thought somebody should have found her. <laughs> not, mar not marzipan. I do love marzipan, though, Janine. <laughs> I come from a German family. We have marzipan, marzipan every Christmas. Marzipan, mm -mm -mm. love that stuff. So I'm looking for the toxicology thing. Um, uh, oh, she got a makeover ready to kill herself is what Anne thinks. And let's see, um, a very female thing to do. The photo looks like a pile of clothes. There was a jacket. Now there's two theories. One is the jacket was wrapped around her to be brought. The other one was the jacket was put on the ground. So she sat on the jacket. So she sat on the jacket and took the rest of the pills, you know, finished the tying up or whatever. And then when she got, you know, got woozy, she just fell over into the fetal position. That was a theory on that one. Um, uh, well, wait a minute. Um, yeah, the unknown event. Because because so she died of drugs. It's the the cause of death was not a question. It was the manner of death. Um, now. Um, <laughs> for, for the marzipan German Jews marzipan and all kinds of trees yes we do um, I'm half German so anyway I wasn't no, my father was German I was never half German I was always American okay so oh I got it here here's a tox tox report non-lethal doses of two Valium related drugs also sedatives aspirin and antihistamines 10 times a lethal dose of morphine and 20 to 80 doses of I can't pronounce it fluorazepam um she had to swallow some of it, at least swallowing 20 to 80 doses would make her unconscious in six, three to four hours. Swallowing 10 doses of morphine would knock her out in an hour. Taking both would knock her out in 15 minutes. The RNCP didn't believe anyone could have forced her to swallow that number of pills. Exactly. Cause you have bruising on the face and all that. Um, so uh, they said they, they thought she took the stuff and then staged the scene. Uh, there is a needle mark on in the arm, but again, she kept having these needle marks. I don't know if she just liked to stab herself with a needle and ch chuck it, you know, to make it look like somebody had grabbed her and stabbed her. Um, so uh, then, okay, let me let me go to the coroner's inquest. This is the part that really makes me laugh. You know, my theory thing on jury systems is so. Anyway, they decide to have a coroner's inquest. There's no defendant. That's because she's dead. What they're doing is they're presenting the evidence. And the jury is going to decide, there's five people on the jury, between murder, suicide, natural death, or accidental death, or death by undetermined circumstances. Now, they had 75 witnesses, okay? 75 witnesses. Uh, and they, 75 witnesses, it took them, oh, wait a minute, let me see where the, how long it took, um, 40 days of testimony. And after that, the jury came back like in three hours and said, undetermined essentially undetermined now you want to hear who the jury is this is this is my problem with juries juries again let me find you the jury okay so think about this because i just think this is crazy my my anti-citizen jury system this is a case that been going on for eight years it had involved two police departments at least lots and lots of detectives they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars there were psychiatrists involved all these people were involved in this case and they, they the police determined it was the police determined it was suicide but nobody liked that so you know people started going yeah it was suicide the family and friends and other people who don't understand things right no 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 she was murdered all the attacks were real attacks so they had this inquest to get into the meat of it to find out if they put all the evidence there 
what actually happened. Now, what's interesting is there was never any back and forth on the evidence. There's just people going witness after witness, just saying things out of order, just boom, 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 boom. This is what happened. Then this is what happened. I say this and I say this and I say this and I say this. Now, you want to hear who the jury is? A bus driver, a retired furnace repair company owner, a housewife, a shop owner, and a property owner. <laughs> so eight years, you've had experts trying to determine what happened. And after eight years of experts coming up with their conclusions, instead of listening to them, you bring in five people off the bus stop. <laughs> it's all not 12 this time. Five people off the bus stop. A bus driver, like, and he listens to this crap for days and days and days and doesn't have time even to study it, to ask his own questions, to do anything else. He's got no expertise again in, in evidence. He's, uh, he's got no expertise in profiling. He's got no ex expertise in crime scene analysis. He's got no expertise and neither does the furnace repair guy or the shop owner, the housewife or the property owner. They don't have expertise. And after all this stuff, all this money is spent, 40 days and all these witnesses, these five people go back in the room and go, what the hell do we know? We'll just say it's undetermined. <laughs> it's the craziest thing ever. I'm like, that is so stupid. So stupid. Oh, my God. <laughs> so they came up with nothing. So now I have to tell you the, the end of this whole story. Uh, the final episode here. You had to wait for this theory of <laughs> merch. 12 people on a bus stop. That's what my new cup is supposed to say, right? They got 12 people up. The jury was 12 people off a bus stop, right? Um, now, here's the theory. Now, I want you to hear the last theory and tell me what you think of this one. So they get all the way to the end, and this is the theory that caught their attention. Because at that time, there was a satanic panic thing going on that had involved a bunch of psychiatrists, and, and it was all nonsense. And the psychiatrists had, you know, hypnotized people, and they came up with these recovered memories and all this garbage, um, which is complete garbage. So anyway, there apparently there was a guy named J James Tyhurst, who was a big, huge psychiatrist, very prominent psychiatrist. And apparently he, he had been like getting, he, he wanted to be a slave master. So he got a bunch of his patients and made them slaves. And he was the master. And he got basically, you know, a little S&M stuff going on there. And um, so he, he, got, he got arrested for it at some point, right? But he always saw the training of many, many uh, psychiatrists. And claims they claim that at some point he treated cindy you see so then some people think james tyhurst some people who are these some people oh yeah the internet um they think that james tyhurst who trained most of the doctors who treated cindy especially during hospitalization were responsible for what happened to cindy ozzy said a group of men had tortured and killed cindy tyhurst participated in the brainwashing studies and maybe he brainwashed cindy did she change her last name to James as a homage to Tyhurst? Because he's James Tyhurst. If Cindy possibly knew Tyhurst through his school and her ex also knew Tyhurst at times, then let's see what happened here. Uh, so they thought maybe Tyhurst is responsible for her death, you see. So it was revealed that a victim first filed a complaint in 1981. And this is when Tyhurst turned his focus on Cindy. Cindy witnessed something. The summer she saw Roy dismember someone in the cabin. One version is that they were Tyrus victims. <laughs> oh my God. Cindy saw Tyrus treating a patient as a slave or Tyrus was showing Ray how to brainwash a patient and she saw it. They were all in on the slave master bit. So she witnessed this thing and then Roy convinced her to stay silent. But when Roy's and Cindy's marriage crumbled, Tyrus thought Cindy would go to the police. So he took matters into his own hands. He chose slow torture to brainwash her, but he never meant to kill her. Yeah, because he's a nice guy. Um, maybe Roy helped Tyhurst, but got out of it got out of hand, and and and, uh, and he never told the truth. Or maybe Cindy found out about the slave master relationship, and Tyhurst went after her behind Roy's back. Perhaps Tyhurst and his accomplices slowly drove San Cindy insane with attacks, and he died. And then. One of the detectives got her into psychiatric help with Marcus, who knew Tyhurst. That's, an, that's another psychologist or psychiatrist. And he diagnosed her with a personality disorder. Now, no one would ever believe her. And it ended badly. Holy God almighty. I mean, he, you know, so then they actually, this, this podcast people actually go and investigate this stuff. You know, I'm like, what? 
just uh, just absolute nonsense. So then finally they say, oh, we never found anything to prove it. <laughs> well, maybe you shouldn't even brought the crap up because you never, it was, it was total nonsense. You put a whole bunch of people's names out there. You, you maligned them, um, claiming that they, Roy and, and her, her therapist were all in on this possible thing, but they never found proof. We're just going to ruin your name. Um, and... Yeah, so see, then, then finally they say, we reached out to the officer who discovered Tyhurst and knew Cindy's case, and he said it wasn't connected. Cindy wasn't even cons considered a potential victim. So maybe Susan, Cindy wasn't murdered, says the host. Maybe she wasn't murdered, and she was doing this to herself. And then she goes into the talk about how women from the traumas from childhood bring them to these places, and she's not, you know, she's not really a psychopath or a narcissist. She's just a uh, a, a sad person who's suffering from trauma. And so, yeah. Um, so then uh, that's, that is basically the end of the story. Um, so the inquest got, came up with nothing and there are some people, you know, so now the thing is all still up in the air, supposedly. So anyway, it took me a long time to go through this entire podcast and type all this crap down so I'd have the notes. Um, but I did think it was fascinating, both in the sense that they never brought up Munchausen's. I don't know why. And secondly, you know, they didn't bring up these interesting points that, that you figured out, which is why wouldn't she live in a different location? Why wouldn't she live with somebody? Why wouldn't she move out of the area, move out of the state, move out of the country? Why would she walk her dog in the dark? You know, all these different things that she didn't do. And, and why would she keep calling the police if she wasn't supposed to do that because it, they would kill her family? But And they wouldn't know, know what she was saying to the police. So why would you, if you knew who did it, wouldn't you want the police to go after them and put you in protective custody? Why would you just keep going to the police and making the tip killer, or no, not the killer, making your harasser think you were going to rat him out? Constantly thinking you're ratting him out. Well, you know, I'd, if I were that guy, I'd come back and kill you really quick. So, <laughs> so that none of that makes sense. <sighs> So I think Munchausen is there all over the map. I think she's had to have evidence of that earlier in life. Um, and I think every single attack she staged, and I do think the final attack was also staged. Um, so, you know, I don't think anybody else was ever involved. Um, it's a very crazy case. I've never heard of a uh, Munchausen's person going on that long, but, you know, uh, not so, it does happen. So, you know, and this is a fascinating case where it really proves it did. Now I'm going to get to uh, look at your comments here and see what else you have to say. All right. Uh, Humanimal asked how old Cindy was. She was 44, I believe, at the time she died. Um, well, you know, no. Were all the cops distracted by her? No. That was one, one cop was distracted by her. Nobody else was. They all thought she did it. Uh, they I say they they did do due diligence. So I can't blame the police because I I really think they worked their butts off to try to figure out what happened because it was so weird that they did all these you know surveillances and and tapping and they interviewed a ton of people. They were trying to find out whether she did it herself or somebody was doing it to her. They didn't just toss her off uh, like you're a false reporter. Get out of here, which they probably thought. So I think they went beyond what I think many police departments would have done. So to, to, to say the police didn't do their job, I think was really wrong in this case, because I, I was very impressed with what they did. And the psychiatrist, although I'm not always fond of how psychiatric work works, uh, I don't always agree with the diagnoses or their methodologies of treatment. I would say that most of these psychiatrists who work with her tried their best within their profession. I, I don't see anything to blame them on either. So I think the, the, the police went out of the way, the psychiatrists went out of the way, the friends, the, the family didn't do much. Like, honest to God, I think the family was stayed away from her most of the time. I think, I think they feel guilty now. They didn't do something, but I honestly think they didn't spend that much time with her. You know, the, the brother came out to help her once and the sister came out once, but other than that, they didn't really hang out with her or, or, encourage her to do other things. They didn't say they were trying to get her out of the area or providing protection for her. That, I think they I think they knew something was wrong with that girl. And so they just kept their distance. But the friends and the neighbors were absolutely out of this world helpful. They were watching her house. They were, they were doing everything for her. She had more help and more investigation than I have seen almost any 
victim, a real victim of a crime. So I don't like the fact that this podcast trashed the police and, and the psychiatrist. I think that was, and how society just let her down. No, they didn't. She, you know, sometimes people are what they are. And she, she was the one that damaged society. She damaged people's reputation. She wasted tons of police money. Um, she did a lot of harm to people. And, you know, it's not a nice thing to harm people like that. And, and so you have to have a lack of empathy for other people. So I think she did. I think she had a massive lack of empathy. Okay, let me see. Um, oh, Paige says, I have known two, I've known two females that are like this, absolutely capable of this. And it's scary. Yeah. I, I say I've run into an awful lot um, of women who have contacted me and, and are, are Munchausen's. I've worked, when I worked with uh, sign language interpreting at the hospitals, I ran into them. I remember one woman, every time I interpreted for her, she would say that she was being stalked again. And I was just, she would say, I, just, I was just in the cafeteria and this man was, he was staring at me and he started making, he started reaching for his pants and everything. And I'm looking at her going, you're six foot two Amazonian woman who is about 50 and not all, all that attractive. I'm sorry. I just don't think he, you're being picked on by men. <laughs> I'm like, sure. Sign language. Sure. Uh, <laughs> um, your family. Yeah. Our family was very distant. And I, and that I do, I really do wonder about that. You know, why there was a distant, all the brothers and sisters just seem to be distant. I, you know, I, I have a feeling that that's why I'd love to have known exactly how she behaved with the family. There were some stories like she, I think she went to her sister's wedding and acted weird there and accused her father or something while she was at the wedding and left early or something. There was, there was one thing about the wedding. So I'm going to say there were probably many things. Also it was claimed that her brother sexually assaulted her, but did he, or did she just claim that? So, you know, I'm going to say the Munchausen's was there way before and, the family knows, but they don't want to admit it. Oh, thank you very much, Doreen. That's fantastic. Thank you for helping the show. Um, you said it was absolutely fascinating. I'm, I'm glad. It was a very difficult one to do in the sense that, you know, it's so much information and to break it down or to, you know, to have you mm, be able to see how it all plays out and to understand what doesn't make sense in the red flags. I was trying to figure out how I could do that without, you know, I know, so that's why it was a long show and I had to bring you through all of it. But I, I do, I'm glad you got something out of it. And, uh, you know, I say the, when you, when you listen to this podcast, what happens with these podcasts is that you are led and you aren't, you don't, there's no stopping and discussing what, what doesn't make sense here. You're kind of led to hear the story and then, oh my God, and now let's hear what this happened. And now what happened here? Now I'm glad they at least ended with thinking that it was not a murder after they dragged us through all that and came up with so many crazy theories. Uh, but I still would like to have had point, had them point out all the things that didn't make sense along the way. Like why, why, why are you walking your dog after dark? I think it's a very simple one, but that was never mentioned in, the, in there and they never talked about those things. So that's why I wanted to do the show. <laughs> You'll have to buy the $500 book. I really want that book. I'm really curious what, Oh, sorry. Um, I'm really curious what's in that book because I think he was there first. He sounded like a very rational guy and he believed she was when she, she, he believed that she staged all these. Uh, but there were a lot of details in that book. I believe would have been very interesting because I think he did more of his homework. And um, but, you know, I can't I can't pay 500. Sorry, <laughs> I'm against that. <laughs> so um, let me see what this is. Uh, Joe says. I would work with a young woman who was forever accusing men of sexually harassing her, including a couple of police officers. Wishful thinking. She was no oil painting. <laughs> yeah. You know, it gets you attention and people, especially when it comes to sexual assault, we you know sometimes you see this a little with the me too movement. You know, there are women who were truly sexually assaulted, but there's other women who will just jump on the, you know, jump on the board, the train, you know, and say me too, you know, which is kind of interesting that that was the, you know, that was the, the saying was me too. Uh, it's like, we're, yeah, so many of us, we all suffered these things, me too. And, you know, once you start something, especially when you've got a lawyer involved and you put out to the public that this particular person has sexually assaulted somebody or sexually harassed somebody, all of a sudden like 50 women show up going me too. And the thing is you get attention. Now people go, Oh my God, you know, you too. And, and you can also maybe make money in a big lawsuit. Uh, so, Yes, attention. It, it's one of those things that when a woman says 
she suffered a sexual assault. Other women, especially, know that this is a horrific thing. They know what it does to a woman to be sexually assaulted, how damaging it is, how hor horrific it is, how it sometimes it stays with you for years, especially depending on how bad the assault was. Um, and the last thing you want to do is say to a woman who says she's been sexually assaulted is, I just don't believe you. You know, <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it isn't true. You know, nobody wants to say that because they think they're like, like re-victimizing somebody. And so the police, they often have this problem. Somebody comes in and files a you know, report that they've been sexually assaulted by a guy they went out to dinner with or their boyfriend or their whomever. And the police are like, you know, on one hand, you know, if you're, especially when you're in the sexual assault unit, you know, you, this is what you do is your job is, is, is investigating sexual assaults. And so you have been to many sexual assaults that are truly sexual assaults and your heart goes out to those victims, but then you get the other ones in. You're like, I'm just not sure I'm believing this one because her story isn't quite working for me, but you don't, you know, you, you almost feel guilty saying that because it makes you a bad person. And if you write in a report, it makes you a bad cop, you see. So it's a tricky situation when it comes down to the police having to deal with the realities of, is it true or isn't it true? Am I, is it a false report or is it, is she a true victim? Very, very tough. Um, it says, I agree that Cindy could have been molested in her family. It, she could have been um, because sometimes, you know, the reason you become what you become is because you do have tough times when you're a kid. <laughs> you know, she may have been sexually assaulted. She may not have been. We just don't know. We don't, I don't know the dynamics of the family. It's a little weird. It's, there's the, the father is painted as rather a domineering, controlling, and so, somewhat mean and, and cruel person. He is portrayed that way, but only by, I don't know, there's six kids, one's dead. Um, Melanie has some things to say, but we're only getting a little pieces, little pieces of information. I don't know how true they are, you know? And then of course, mom's there too. So the mother can influence things too. Sometimes you'll see a person uh, have a psychopathic mom and they'll turn out to be very psychopathic themselves or a very narcissistic mom that influences them. So it, I don't know, obviously how we live when we're children and, and how we're, how we're brought up with, we're brought up with love or brought up with cruelty makes a huge difference on what kind of person we are when, when we grow up. So she may well have been abused. Uh, and I, I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, yes. She, her family, apparently her family went, went, was going to Europe and she didn't want to go for, to Europe. So she, she went to nursing school and the father insisted that she be near relatives if she's going to go to nursing school and, and that it was kind of presented as how, how pushy and mean he was, but I thought that was a very reasonable fatherly thing to do. So again, it's just quite, quite hard to know. Oh, the bad seed. That's a great movie. That is a creepy old black and white movie. That's one of my favorite movies on psychopathy and little female child psychopath. Definitely one of my favorite movies. That one's, that one's really well done. I like that one. Good, good suggestion there. Um, Well, that's a good point. Doreen says the parents could be 100% warning everyone to believe Cindy. No, uh, yeah. So they don't have to dig further into family secrets. Yes, that's an excellent point. Because if she's making it up, <laughs> why is she? It, is it because she had horrible tr childhood trauma? But if she wasn't making it up, you were a wonderful family, wonderful parents, everything was perfect. And then this bad person came into her life. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, I agree. Let's see. Uh, oh, oh, oh. I'm having the bad seed is superb. You bet. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that movie freaked me out. Lord help us. <laughs> that was creepy though. It's like, don't look at children the same. You're like, are you the bad seed? You know? <laughs> so, uh, I love that movie. Oh, it's great. Um, let me see. Uh, let me go back up here. I'm going to go back a little bit because I know I missed some of your really cool comments. Um, uh, there is, uh, yeah, I'm not going to do anything political here, a political comment, but um, anything, anything has to do with politics, I'm steering away from because that always makes everybody mean and crazy. Uh, so I'm not going to, even if I agree with some of the comments, I simply won't talk about. Um, I'm like, let's see. Uh, and, and Steve says, family's very quiet. Are they in denial? Uh, and I, I think so. I mean, I I have a hard time thinking that they don't, 
they don't see it because they know her and they had they had some issues with her and so i do believe they know that she's has issues and she did go to a mental institution so they know she has mental problems of course they're trying to say it's only after the stalking started but i'm going to say they probably know more than they're saying they're just denying it now because well the sister wrote a book so well, i can't find it so i think maybe she wrote it and didn't sell it but um I think they just, they, the father basically just says, I just want, you know, we'll just have to accept the way it is. And then uh, that's that and let it go. And this, even the sister says it's time to let it go. And I know she's got a point, even if they think she's innocent, um, they got a point because it's been years and years and it's, you know, it's not going to go anywhere and they've got to kind of accept it. Um, let me see if I, I'm going back a little bit here. Let's see if I missed anything. Lots of marzipan comments. <laughs> um Chocolate and marzipan. Oh, that'll work. That'll work. Um, let me see if there's anything else. Oh, we got. Um, well, that's an interesting concept. Did he plant the seed, start stalking, and she liked it? Well, you know, I get. You know, I guess that's possible. You know, um, some some people think that the ex-husband Roy was a little bit wacko himself so could he have done a little bit of something and then she's like well i'm just gonna i'm i've seen him do this and i'm just gonna exaggerate it and then get him in trouble and they had a really weird relationship they went on and off and on and off after they were you know separated um so i don't know but you know clearly the too many of these things were done in a way that that appeared that no one else was involved. So, um, so I would say even if he did do some little quirky things here and there, he he wasn't responsible for those those major attacks and all that. Um, well, <laughs> Humanimal says, "What says? Can I ask? Did your dad change his surname to Brown when he emigrated, or is that an original, or is it your married name?" Is it too personal? Yeah, I'm, I'm easy with personal things. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, my, my maiden name is a German name. Uh, my father did not change it. I had my, my, had my maiden name all the way till I got married. I married a Brown. Um, he's from Jamaica, so his name was Brown. Um, and so I became Pat Brown, which was a lot easier than my maiden name, which had three syllables and nobody could say it. And so I, I, I was married for 25 years. I became a profiler. I was using Pat Brown as my as my professional name and on my books. And then I got divorced and I'm like, well, I'm not giving that name back. <laughs> you know? It's great. I, I've been Pat Brown so long. I I'm Pat Brown. You know, I don't mind that, you know, I, my ex has the same name. He is the father of my children and my sons have that name. My daughter's married. Her name has changed, but you know, I'm, I'm good with it. I, you know, I don't have any problems with it. I'm not proud to be part of the Brown family and I'm still proud to have, you know, my, some of my, in-laws or they're browns too and I, I love them so yeah i'm good with brown <laughs> so i never did change it because it is a lot easier and it fits on the book so <laughs> but i'm okay with a i don't know if i saw this before nicole did i see this i'm not sure I don't, I don't know if i saw it or not but anyway thank you if i didn't say that before i just saw it and i can't remember now because it's been two hours and i appreciate it that's wonderful um so anyway i'm going to get back down to the bottom and let's see, because it's getting to be five. Oh, it's six o'clock. My goodness gracious. Um, had a thought. Yeah, that was the that was the person the three faces of Eve. That was what they called split personality. Um, and now they're calling it dissociative. Wait a minute, I just lost it now. Identity. Dis dis dissociative identity disorder. They just changed it to a less, a, I guess. A fancier name yeah she could have i just i don't buy it because i don't I, I in a sense i can understand i've always been quite question whether how much this condition actually exists but let's say one part of you acts like that kind of a one is very prim and the other ones are kind of a hoe bag you know <laughs> and the prim one is very prim and then you go off and you go drinking and stuff and you're a kind of, you know you're out there sleeping with men and then you come back and you're like you no, know, I don't remember doing that. And maybe you don't. Okay. Maybe that really works, but I do not believe she would be able to plan as cleverly as she planned, which took a lot of planning. And that personality cannot like hang around during all that time for her to be able to do that. 
I don't believe it for a minute. I think she's Munchausen's, uh, which is, I, I say, a behavior based on narcissism and psychopathy. So that she herself has narcissistic tendencies. She needs tremendous attention. She doesn't, uh, she wants people to, um, she do, she's unempathetic toward other people, perhaps, except the children. It's hard to tell. Is she empathetic toward the children or just children small and easily manageable and makes her feel good? Doesn't mean, mean you have empathy. Um, is she manipulative? Is she, does she lie? All these things. If she has all of those, she has a highly narcissistic personality in which it plays out as Munchausen's. Um, uh, so I don't, I personally don't think they, she's got any kind of split personality thing. I do not. I think she's too, it, she had to be too, um, she had to have control of her thinking to be able to do what she did. So I, I don't, I don't believe so. Um, is, uh, no. Because it's 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 not a, it's really not a syndrome. I don't like Munchausen syndrome. Really, it's not a syndrome. It's a behavior. It's the behavior of drawing attention to yourself through self harm or pre, or pretense of self harm. That's all it is. It's a behavior. It's like a serial killer is not a serial killer syndrome. <laughs> serial killer is a behavior. It's like I'm a psychopath, but I like to kill people a lot. <laughs> that makes me a serial killer. So I'm a woman who likes to bring self harm to myself. That's a that's a fake self harm. I like to go in and pretend I've been harmed. I like to pretend I've been raped. I've been all the, I want to pretend all these things to get attention. That's, that's not a syndrome. That's, that's narcissism or psychopathy. And Munchausen is just the name for the behavior. So I, I think it's a, it's a bad name in my opinion. Um, so, <clears throat> sorry, wait a minute. <coughs> let me get, let me have something to drink. Mm. Uh, um, no, I have not watched the HBO series. I'm not, I have a, I have a really mixed feeling on things. I, I generally do not like these series. And uh, I mean, I do, sometimes I do television when, when I'm talking about serial killers or whatever. And I particularly don't like these shows that I even do half the time <laughs> because I find them too chopped up. I find them too storytelling. I find them they don't get into the depth I would like them to get into. I don't trust them because a lot of times they make up stuff and there's not, you know, I don't like the way they're edited and they're, they're manipulated and they have agendas. I don't tend to like them. However, sometimes when I'm going to do a particular case, then I will look at a documentary related to it. Uh, and, and I try to get enough different um, uh, inputs so that I don't just buy whatever this one says, because I, I know how it works. I've been around the television industry too long and I know you can't trust it. And the same thing is true for authors and books. They want to sell a book like the Black Dahlia thing with Steve Hodell saying his daddy was a killer Black Dahlia. He has so much mis misinformation in there and so much nonsense and so many rabbit holes that if you go in and just believe what he says, well, then you're going to go down that rabbit hole. But for me, I'm reading it going, I'm not buying this. And so I try to read as many different books as I can or study things, anybody I can get that, you know, information I can get that seems legitimate. And then I just have to weigh it out because unless I work the case and I've seen the police evidence, I'm going to be a little limited, as we all are, you know, uh, in making any conclusions. And again, that's why I say I'm not here to solve crimes. I'm here to educate and teach people how things work how profiling works, how to look at the evidence. That's, that's what this channel is about because I'm, you know, I'm not absolutely sure that I have all the evidence and that I should, and that it's accurate. So, um, yeah, they, they, they do have that. <laughs> they do have a slant. <laughs> yeah. And it's unfortunate because that's why I won't do any shows anymore on a particular case because I've been stabbed in the back too many times on that. Um, I did the recent one I did. Uh, it'll be out. I don't know when it's coming out. I did a show on uh, serial killers. And I did two different shows on two different serial killers. Uh, and that show, I don't know how it's going to come out, but you know, I'm just going to, they're just going to give clips of what I said about serial killers. So I'm not too worried about that, but I will no longer do a particular case because sometimes they'll bring me in just to be the bad guy, you know, so they'll come and say, Oh, look what Pat Brown says. And then the other guy goes, she's an idiot. <laughs> this is what truly happened. <laughs> and so, you know, it's really, it's, it's terrible. It's like professionals, instead of having different people give opinions and being, you know, 
nice toward each other on these shows. So they, they, you know, they have an agenda before the show starts. Like, this is what our theory is. And we're going to bring in somebody to give a different theory. And then we're going to shoot them down and make them look like fools. <laughs> really nice. <laughs> um, oh, okay. Uh, you might have to watch the, uh, Dr. Grande for this one. How is Munchausen different from hist histrionic personality disorder? Well, okay. I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Um, histrionic, um, it is, when you have histrionic, let me see if I can do, tell you this correctly, because it's it's a little, look, these a lot of these labels that are in the DM, uh, DM, what I forgot the name of the book is <laughs> the psychiatric book. Um, uh, the manual with 500,000 uh, descriptions for different di different mental conditions that they change all the time. Um, uh, diagnostic, lost my mind. I can't remember. But anyway, um, I know it. I just, I'm just, I'm just can't remember for some reason. Anyway, somebody come up with it and then I'll, then we'll, oh, thank you, DSM. <laughs> I was going DMV. I'm like, no, that's a Department of Motor Vehicles. <laughs> it's not that. Yes, thank you, DSM. And it's they have all these different ones, two, three, four. Are they on five? I don't know where they're at. Um, but there's a lot of overlapping things, so it gets really confusing sometimes. Histrionic is basically that the person is um, as gets a very, shall we say, um, crazed about things it really blows them out of proportion and things like that um but munchausen's i think is more of a methodical plan so histrionic can be like all over the place oh my god you know this happened to me you know but this is very very planned that's the way i look at it but uh, i i would you know i'd have to relook at exactly what they said his you know depending on I may have to look it up. I'm going to Google crap. Let me Google it. Just so, just so I can see what they say for histrionic. Um, history, histrionic, what they're saying is histrionic personality disorder. I love Google. All right. Uh, basically, they're saying they have uh, just self-esteem depends on the approval of others. People with this disorder have an overwhelming desire to be noticed and often behave dramatically or inappropriate to get attention. Now, so I, I think what they're saying is that you could be do things that are outrageous. Like, let's say you go to a club and you, you, you have, let's say you have, you're going to, um, you're just having a, um, a karaoke night. And there's a cool, cool karaoke song, which is kind of sexy. And you get up there and start ripping your clothes off and start doing a strip tease. <laughs> that might be inappropriate. You know, you shouldn't be doing that. So overdoing things to get attention, to uh, to exaggerate, that, that's different than, um, like, for example, I could say something like, um, uh, no, I'm trying, I'm trying to think of a good example. Oh. Uh, I worked for this boss and he always, he always was trying to, he's always trying to sleep with me. All the bosses are always trying to sleep with me. Every boss I've ever been with has tried to sleep with me, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So it's not like you're planning out a whole little methodology thing to then present. It's that you just keep, you know, you get a lot of crazy stuff that you just exaggerate. That's how I view it. It's again, it's a very overlapping thing. So yeah. And so go to Dr. Grandi on that one. He's probably better on that. Um, <laughs> So, um, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay, let me see what. I... Really? Oh, check out that one. So, Twilight Zone has an interesting one with split personality. Oh, I love the Twilight Zone. That was such a good show. That really was a great show. And I'm sorry that that, you know, I, it got, luckily we can go, we can still see it. That's the great thing about, you know, Amazon Prime and Netflix and YouTube. You can go see all the things that you would like to, um, that you missed when you were either younger or you never, you weren't born yet <laughs> or you forgot to watch them or you can't remember them. So. Wow. Okay. Forever is watching some. <laughs> well, Paige says histrionic is a nightmare to deal with or diagnose. Well, you know, it's interesting. I just want to point out, because you say that, 
these psychiatrists came up with like seven different diagnoses. As I said before, psychosis, schizophrenia, borderline personality disorder. They never mentioned Munchausen. <laughs> um, <laughs> histrionic was probably in there. Uh, anxiety. I mean, they had like 10 or you know, 10 different ones. Now, some would say there were, they would actually diagnose her with four or five different disorders. And the other one would, then there'd be people who just come up with one or two. I'm like, so the DSM, I'm like, what's the rule here for how many diagnoses you can give one person? I mean, I mean, do they just get one? Do they get a dozen? And do you, and is it okay if like five different psychiatrists come up with five different diagnoses? I think the problem with psychiatry is that it is not really a science. It's an art. Um, a lot of things aren't based on solid evidence. It's based on your perception of the person's behavior. It's based on whether you believe what they're saying, uh, the stories that they give, are they even true? Um, because, you know, even when you have people who aren't psychopaths, you know, if you get a couple in and, and you ask what, who, who's doing what in a marriage, they have different perceptions. And it doesn't mean that one is lying or the other one's lying. It's just they have different perceptions or they're lying. But <laughs> then you have to try to figure out who's telling the truth and and you try to put it all together. And it's not that scientific. It's sort of like a collage of stuff that you try to come up with the most reasonable idea. And then you try to take that most reasonable idea and you try to find a way to help that person based on sort of where you think they're coming from. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, I just don't consider it a science. Um, no, so I'm sure some psychologists will entirely disagree with me, but I do think it's it's a little bit more of a, you know, an art than a science. You know, because when you when you go in, you, you broke your leg, and you go in, and the X-ray looks at it, and your leg's like, eh, you know, that's science. <laughs> but if the person tells you how they feel about their leg, it's a little more questionable. Uh, profiling people ask, is that a science? Well, it should be. It should not be an art. Um, there's too much art and a lot of profiling, which means I'm just making crap up and being impressive. But what one should look is do crime scene analysis so that you take the evidence and you bait the evidence, you look at that and you determine from the evidence. So theoretically, you're using a scientific method, but I guess somebody could say there's a little bit of art in that too. Just try to stay away from too much art. <laughs> so, um, all right. I think I'm going to, head out now. I'm supposed to go meet somebody. I think we're going to see a movie. If I can get there. Oh, I better get there. <laughs> I have to run right now to go see the movie. So anyway, I'm so glad you were here. This was fantastic. Uh, I really enjoyed it as usual. I like to see all my friends. Um, yes, this is true. Oh, I have to point this out. See, I have trouble leaving because you keep saying cool things. I saw science that slips into pseudoscience rather easily, in my opinion. Yeah, that's, that is, that's tricky. It really is tricky. And I, I entirely agree with you. Um, I would, but, um, what, what did I, what you thought I would like it, but you thought it was a true crime series. What, what was that? <laughs> okay. I'm trying to figure out what you were talking about too now. Eh. <laughs> Joe says I did a course for work in behavioral disorders and was surprised of how many there types of different types there were. They often overlap. Yes, I agree. It's not an exact science. It is very confusing. I mean, that's why the DSM, which is now no longer the DMV. <laughs> thank you for telling me. I'm like, what, what letters are those? Yeah. So the DSM, I mean, recently, the last edition they put out, they actually took some of them away. I forgot how many they removed. And I'm like, so the edition before you said these existed, and now you say they don't exist. <laughs> so yes, it's, it, there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of yeah. Oh my God. There's so many disorders that are in there. I'm not even sure you could call disorders, but you know, it, it's, you know, no, you, you, every, every so often you got to put a new book out, a new manual, you got to fix it up and add to it. So, you know, people do. So anyway, <laughs> okay. I got to head out. I really do. Uh, thank you very much, Paige. And thank you, Christina. I appreciate that. Oh, Doreen, that's lovely. Thank you. Okay. Okay. That's it. I got to go. I got to go uh, have a social life outside of internet. <laughs> like I get to see people. I wish I could see you guys. I wish you're like all sitting here, but you're not. So I'm going to go see like uh, people I can touch for a second, you know, <laughs> but I do love my YouTube channel and I love having you here. And I thank you again so much. 
And if you made it to the end and haven't already subscribed, please do that. And that would be wonderful. And please do share on any true crime site so you can help build the channel that way. Um, and so I will be taking off now. Hold on one second. I'm trying to, I have to hit these things, these little buttons and you know how hard that is. Okay, here we go. So now I can say goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>